and we are recording a podcast uh with slides uh i think everything's going i think we should be good beautiful um, are you going to talk about the amish no I'm you, gonna you, you've the teased amish. us with this, this image yeah. sons with, with of horse this, two two, we two slides amish with the amish last week yeah well two two slides with the amish on it uh it it two episodes in a row um oh, no. thank you okay hello and welcome to well there's your problem it's a podcast about engineering disasters with slides i'm justin rosnick i'm the person who's talking right now uh my pronouns are he and him all right go i am alice cordor kelly i'm the person who's talking now my pronouns are she and her yay liam yay liam hi i'm liam anderson my pronouns are he and him we have a guest we do have a guest hi. i'm kevin my pronouns are he and him and uh, you're just kevin you because kevin. of like yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah why are you here kevin why are you here kevin? uh well, I am a forester and a wildlife biologist, and I'm here to talk about trees and forests. Cool. Now, but I thought, I thought the natural state of nature was this bucolic scene you see in front of us. I'm going to... I, 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 naturally occurring road. grain <laughs> silos. Uh, <laughs> naturally I, occurring, I, like, un rows of corn. Unsafe the GTI on this road. I mean, I kind of see a few natural things in there being the trees in the background but the rest of that is you know horses are native to europe or asia the grass is probably native to asia and corn native to mexico domesticated so not a lot of native in there wow i did not I know that so simply and off the <laughs> land hmm. Kevin, <laughs> just uh, just uh indulge you for a second what is what is trees what is yeah, a so, tree what is trees so a tree is you know, as we define it in forestry, it's a perennial woody plant. It's at least two inches in diameter at four and a half feet off the ground. Uh, it's at least 16 feet tall. Uh, there, are, you could make an argument for tree ferns being trees. I don't really buy that, you know, but I don't deal with tree ferns. I will not accept palms and bamboo as trees. Those are grasses. <laughs> Those are grasses. Come on. I, I, was, I was sort of not expecting there to be like a height and weight requirement, so to speak. You know, like... Yeah. What class? I didn't know there were really controversial tree opinions out there. <laughs> yeah. I, you gotta, it's a science. You gotta define everything. Everything is defined. Hmm? Otherwise, you can do the Socratic thing. Well, is this truly a tree? Is this, you know, shrub a tree? No, no, no. It's a shrub. It's not a tree. If you have a one of those trees that's been grafted together, um, oh, a tobacco a, plant, yes, yeah, that, that would be like a featherless biped. Shut up! Uh, thereby <laughs> making it a man. <laughs> uh, the sound you hear, listeners and viewers, is the sound of me leaving my house to go hit Ross with a two by four. <laughs> Although I'm not allowed to is, joke is about it, that is apparently. It, is a two by four a tree? Uh, Was it tree? Of it. It was, was at some point. It's like three <laughs> body parts. And yet a piece of the false self, a piece of the true self, exists in the false self. Mm. I say, as I beat Roz to death with a two by four. <laughs> All right, well, we've, so we've now completed yeah. analytic philosophy. All right, yeah. Yeah, yes. congratulations, your packets are in the mail. So yeah, we, uh, we, we have Kevin here to talk about how, how thoroughly we have fucked up forests on the East Coast. Yay! <laughs> I mean, no... <laughs> it's a fun topic. I've been I've been kind of fascinated by this ever since I I heard about it the first time, but but I don't know very much about it. Which so I'm I'm Seven excited four, for this dude. one. It's a mm. fun time. It just keeps me up at night only a couple of days a week. <laughs> <laughs> but first, we have to do the goddamn news. What's this? Good news yeah. in my goddamn news. news segment. Yes. Yeah. So Brandon Johnson, uh, the the candidate that we like for Chicago mayor, is going to be the next mayor of Chicago against the predictions of Lori Lightfoot and every other professional idiot who called this one wrong. But he butts yes. morons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, because it turns out that people actually like when you make cities woke and soy and you defund the police uh and you yeah. uh you know are triggered and owned all of the time he, he, he was he he is going to forcibly trans everyone in chicago 
Thank God yeah. that's my fetish. All right, commusing, commusing in the loop is going to look like a Gerard Butler movie now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Every single Chicagoan will be killed uh, at any moment. And Your sacrifice this, yeah. has been noted. Yeah, and we consider this a victory for the left. Um, yeah. uh, notably because his opponent, Paul Vallis, was sort of like this school privatization, like school vouchers, yeah, he was like the gun for hire. Billy when he was doing it. One of the like worst people. Um, and Walter. yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I saw the Chicago Tribune had a great headline just now about this, which is. Uh, Brandon Johnson, uh, he he thanked, he found room for God in his acceptance speech, but not for Barack Obama. Just very ungrateful of him. And it's like, hmm. what? Huh? What? What? I what? Is is Barack Obama bigger than God? Well, so says the Tribune. Much much like the Beatles. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the Tribune is one of the worst newspapers out there, and ha- historically has been. But Barack Obama. Not bigger than God, I think personally. No, uh, much I, I smaller think it's controversial. than God. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but so Ch- Chicago, uh, you know, progressive Illinois, progressive site of the future, uh, Pritzker carnates, um, and you know, f- fantastic work. Uh, all glory to particularly the the Chicago Teachers Union, who was yes. like famously instrumental in this, and also like one of the best organized unions out there doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, I hope we get a repeat of this in Philly with Helen Gim, uh, who is also oh, supported by our teachers union. Oh, you're you're uh, voting for Gim, huh? Gim? Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, okay. I, 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 I'm definitely going for Gim. I think that there's, uh, you know, we've got a, the mayoral, the field right now is 11 candidates. Yeah, we have there's too many fucking people. <laughs> two progressives, there's eight generics, and there's one fascist. Um, <laughs> what's that uh, who you got as the fascist? Uh, that's uh, what's his face? Brown something. I oh, he keeps yeah, sending yeah, yeah. me Jeff mailers. Brown. Yeah, Jeff, Jeff Brown. Brown. Yeah, yeah. He owns a bunch of shop rights. Oh, oh yeah, God, <laughs> of course he fucking does. Uh, I'm mm. voting for Reinhardt personally, but I respect. You're going for vote. you're going for Reinhardt. Yeah. You're going for Reinhardt? You're going for the Elizabeth Warren of this race? <laughs> you know what? Yes, I am. <laughs> I've liked her. One one thing one thing I will say though uh, about, for about Barry Brandon Stern, Johnson so, uh... is there was a story uh, that the Chicago Fraternal Order of Police uh, like put out at the eleventh hour to try and swing like nervous, squishy liberals, uh, hate has no home here kind of people back towards Paul, which was if Brandon is elected. 800 to 1,000 Chicago Police Department officers will resign overnight, to which uh, get going, we'll boys. Ya. It's time. You know, make it happen. Yep. <laughs> that will make the inevitable remake of the Blues Brothers a much worse movie. Instead of like, you know, 500 cars flipping over, it'll be like two. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, in Brandon Johnson, Chicago, you don't even have a full SWAT team of guys to go like, hut, 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 and like repel no, down the front of the Daily Center. <laughs> <laughs> just one guy going like, "Hey, stop that! Hey, hey, cut hey. that out!" So, so I mean, much, in the car. <laughs> so much like Chase of Udan, I look forward to seeing how they how they fuck him over in office. Um, oh, yeah. Possibly, possibly he evades all of this, and possibly he's like in contention for twenty twenty eight. I don't know, um, but it's it's a good thing in the meantime, and good yeah. for Chicago, good for the teachers. Yeah. Thank you to them for dragging America City's kicking and screaming. Into the 21st century. Um, Ross, and... you want to go ahead and defend Helen Gim appearing at the Union League or no? I just, that, like, that's the that's one I've been like, sitting on. That's like fine. You can okay, just do fine. that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I have no response to that that can air. <laughs> Semper Brandon or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You, you know who else was at the Union League? Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> You know who else yeah, who was else at the Union League? Both you and me, actually. We went for yeah, architectural exactly, form. Exactly. Yeah, how, 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 you can't cancelable? say anything. Is that cancelable? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they'd let us in except for that architectural tour, but... I just want to know what happens when they... Well, they got they got to have a portrait of Trump in there now. But remember they the, didn't? Uh... They were like, oh yeah? Because we went after he was elected. Remember they were like, oh yeah, we're definitely working on it. 
<laughs> we're trying to find an artist who can like really capture his essence. 2018 when we went, like they should have had one at that point. This is true. Really trying to grapple with the like Trump face, you know, it takes a while. Yeah. Oh fuck! We Difficult. should have put we in could, some notes could... about how he got arrested. We were you like, did. "Oh, what should we, yeah, what should we put wait. in the the thing about it?" We, it's like, uh, didn't we talk about that on the last that last episode? I don't remember. I said it was going to happen, but now he's been indicted. It was going to happen. Now now he's we're, yeah, been... we were right. We were right. We predicted it. Uh, Orange man arrested. It pretends uh, this is another news item. Suck yeah. my butt. <laughs> <laughs> Orange man arrested. Uh, I look forward to him like paying a fine for this in like 2026 after his appeals yes. run out, when he has been like elected God Emperor uh, in the last election that the United States will hold. Um, pay a fine of five hundred dollars. Yeah, and two days of community service. <laughs> I do want the photos of Trump doing community service. That's oh, true. that'd be really funny. I want those doing funny. like a Trump. lisa picking thing. Yeah, he, no, yeah. he's working at like a soup kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. I need those photos. That'd be really good. Well, you can always use an AI to generate them. I don't know. I, I'm morally opposed to it. Yeah, reasonable. Well, well as long as you don't know, serve Trump steaks, that that would be more time. Oh, uh, Trump steaks were delicious, and nobody accepted that. I don't accept really? that. No, I'm fucking with you. Okay. I, I, I feel as if I've been rewarded for my skepticism. Yeah, I, 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 I was about Sorry, to say, I, it Sorry, does not Apple. seem like... Weren't they like... You bought them from the sharper image. What? No, you didn't. Is that true? <laughs> was yeah. It, was it the, no, I remember the, hearing that too. <laughs> what? <laughs> the, you, you get your like oh, frozen no, And steaks. also QVC. <laughs> <laughs> that makes it so much better. Yeah, and a package of meat coming from the president. Like... <laughs> <laughs> Things you could say, uh, like pretty much no later than the Coolidge administration, and th like mm -hmm. you know, the president has rewarded you for your your, your help with like the Teapot Dome scandal by uh, you know shipping you some frozen steaks. Um, at, but he brought <laughs> so, back. So, you, you got a political favor from Coolidge by delivering him a, a, a chest freezer full of venison. <laughs> and my dad got paid like that one time. <laughs> Didn't somebody send Taff like a, a raccoon or a possum to eat? Yeah. yeah <laughs> they were trying to compete with the teddy bear and it was a possum, but those stuffed animals didn't sell. I just read uh, the a bio a biography of both uh, TR and Taft, and yeah. They were trying to like get his own teddy bear, but then it ended up being a possum, which scared the kids. I mean, it's the only Incredible. native marsupial. Is it's neat until you yeah, look at put, the tail. put it on. You know, fuck eagles. Put that on the Great Seal. Whoa, possum. whoa, whoa, whoa! Go birds. Go birds. Possum with okay, fine. Yeah, go birds. You make a good <laughs> point. You make a compelling point. But imagine like a spread possum with like a fistful of like grain and a fistful of like a sheaf of arrows. That yeah, is, actually, you know, I, I kind of like that. If mm. if you've ever seen a possum skull, like uh, just like the skull of a possum, their mouths are just jammed full of teeth. Mm. It's just so many teeth in there. There used to be a possum who lived underneath my porch. I saw him every once in a while. I was always happy to see him. <laughs> you know, there's a Trump guy. National Golf Club that claims to be Philly, but it's actually in Pine Hill, New Jersey. That sounds mm. about right. Just learned that. Yeah. Um. Anyway. Anyway. In other news, uh, Haunts, NS has done it Dutch. again. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, congratulations, Nor boys! Norfolk Southern. <laughs> <laughs> Norfolk Southern. Uh, yeah, the fucking Nederlandse Spoorwegen. I I think. Uh, don't quote me on that. Uh, the Dutch train. I never people. was able to pronounce it. <laughs> They, 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 they put a train on the ground. They, 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 um, yeah. The spirit of haunts sort of like descended upon the Netherlands and yes. they ran a high speed uh, passenger train into like a, a, like a line crane, um, which nobody knows why it was there or, you know, why it ran into it, but it killed like one Presumably person. Presumably the guy who put it there knows why it was there. Well, I mean, yeah, but he's not. You don't have to incriminate yourself if you're watching That's those like point, lawyer yeah. TikToks. You know that guy with too many rings on is telling him. You know you don't. You don't got to answer any questions. You don't got to consent to a search of your crane. 
Yeah, this is true. I, I do not consent to join her. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but this, this is, is like, uh, uh, hmm. this killed like four people. Did it? Um, I, I only saw like yeah. one when I, uh, when well, I looked. Maybe it was but, one. Yeah. I don't know. Oh, uh, one person. Nasty wreck with person. a passenger train. Mm, yeah. And this is uh, like in between The Hague and Amsterdam. Um, it's a mm. shame. It's a great shame. Um, but... I've been carrying Donald Trump going for international war crimes. International <laughs> golf club. Yeah, international war crimes tribunal at the international golf club. There is one. There, there is one in Scotland, uh, and there's oh, one God. in Dubai apparently. Because of course, I mean, we, we we ran an international like um, tri criminal tribunal here for the like the Lockerbie bombing future episode. I right, imagine. Right. Uh, oh yeah. So yeah, we made a bit of the Hague temporarily Scotland for legal reasons, which is an interesting uh, bit of like legal history. I love legal fiction. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it's like how so, the Amtrak Cafe car is Washington, D.C. Yeah. <laughs> For legal mm -hmm. reasons. Yeah, also so you can hold like international war crimes tribunals in the cafe car. Yeah, there's not much room, but they do try. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta do it really fast because it's high-speed rail, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, implying Amtrak is high-speed rail. I was about to say, uh -huh. you can do it on a long-distance train, no problem. <laughs> can you imagine getting tried for war crimes on, like, the, uh, the Southwest The Empire Chief Builder? Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> no, the Southwest Chief would make more sense because it gets delayed so often. Yeah. Uh, oh, not the Southwest Chief, the Sunset Limited, that's the, the one. Sunset Limited, yeah. Mm. Hey, I mean, if you can sign the armistice of World War One in a train car, why not? Why not do this? You know? Why not? Yeah. yeah. Why not? I don't know. I've always wanted to take the Southwest Chief. That's always been the, the thing I've wanted. To take. Uh, it's supposed to be the good one, yeah. Uh, mm. But uh, yeah. That's so, all I had. News. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, Norfolk, Norfolk, Norfolk Southern fucks up again. Anyway, yeah, yeah. <laughs> every oh. every train on the ground is a Norfolk Southern joint. Yeah, yeah and that's nothing, jackasses. Yeah, what is this a forest? Is the, yeah, this is where Kevin takes over. All right, thanks. Hey, before we jump into, it, I got to do the science thing where all of the opinions are my own and not a representation of, the, of my employer, uh, who we're just not going to name. For yeah, we're not going to be disclosing that. Uh, you, but it's not a representation of any employer's opinions. It's just you. No. Live, live I, and die on your own merits, Kevin. That's fine. <laughs> I, I have scientific backing for 99% of this. There's like one point where we'll get outside of the literature. So if anyone really has questions, they can email you guys for the citations. No, they can't. We're not no, doing not. your um, office no. hours for you. No, for fuck's sake. no, pay us. <laughs> well, pay I don't us. want them to find me. <laughs> <laughs> We're not we're like the, the, the exploitation of TAs in the podcast industry is getting reprehensible. Are we the like, TAs? Are we the professors? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are we, oh, we're all of it, I think. Yeah, we're both. Yeah. We couldn't unionize <laughs> because we're all management, but that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, we have to live guys, in podcast housing, too. Yeah. You guys get yeah. This is, this is uh, for the engineering folks, this is your uh, elective credit. So we're going to talk about trees. We're going to talk about forests. Uh, forests are some of my favorite things. Um, we defined a tree. Let's define a forest for fun. Uh, a forest is at least one acre of land that's at least 10% covered in trees that's not used for anything else, not urban or agriculture, that is a forest. Um, you can have savannas that are forests. You can have like really dense forests that are forests. Everything that has 10% trees, forest. So, so like that's what a forest is. The plot of land is. behind my childhood home that was in between two subdivisions was a forest. Yes. <laughs> Was it an for this acre? Joke, for this joke, yes. Was it an acre? Probably. Yes. That's a forest. <laughs> yes. Uh, here's a fun one. Uh, because of the UK, we have some really silly oh, measurements in forestry. We use chains. We use links what? to what? measure land. And we use tenths That's of inches what? to measure trees. Why? D don't do that. Don't do that. It's <laughs> your fault, Alice. I know, yeah. I know, and I'm I'm saying don't repeat our mistakes. Don't use ah, our fucking ah, like ah, ah, uh, you, you know it, it, it's it's you know one tenth of a yard arm to the hundred weight ass uh, imperial Ugh. measurement system. Ugh. Well, also on the east coast, we use mets and bounds to define forest property, which is the you worst. Fucking what, dude? <laughs> Uh, we use Mets and Bounds. It's a way of defining forest what land. What do Mets like, have to do with this? What are Mets? Yeah. So Maybe it's the Mets I own <laughs> from the big tree to the stream over to the road. That's my land. Um, 
which is a very silly way to do things. It's how you used to do things in like, you know, the 1500s. And then in America, because this is a good country, we invented the public land survey system in 17, in the 1780s. And everything east or west of Ohio is surveyed in public land survey. So everything is just, just in squares, which makes sense. It makes sense. <sighs> but here it's like, oh, you got to follow this weird, you know, meandering set of directions from the 1800s to figure out where your property boundary is. My and property like boundary is from this tree that existed 200 years ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Please yeah, see it my actually deed. Uh, don't worry about it. You'll mm. see the don't worry about it clause in my deed. So there's this fun, so if you guys read the Jack Frost poem, um, oh, I forget what it's called, but you know, the, Stopping by woods in a snowy evening? No, not quite that one. The other one where they're like walking and they're like walking by the fence and like fences make good neighbors. Yeah. That, that's pre oh, yeah, yeah. So That's how you set boundaries and you agree on those boundaries under Mets and Bounds. Hmm. Is a, is a hmm. fun fact for you. We'll have some more coming up. Don't worry. Okay. So um, <laughs> let's get back to trees. Trees don't care about property. Um, so we're going to talk about mainly forests in Pennsylvania. Thus they are anarchists. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. I am proud of my uh, woody neighbor, my, 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 my woody uh, friends. I'm insisting all trees are communists and they're the precise kind of communist that I am, whatever it is that day. <laughs> no, that's wrong, actually. Mm. <laughs> Some of them you can are... You take your old growth forest and shove them up your ass, Alice. <laughs> Some of them are imperialists. Some of them are imperialists. We gotta watch out. Yeah, the precise kind of <laughs> communist that I am that yeah, day. Yeah. Oh, God. You... The Leninist tree. No, you, you can eat my butt. You have clonal and colonial trees, like Tree of Heaven. That's, that's definitely an imperialist tree. Death the Tree of Heaven. Okay, it's like so landing let's, let's on top of a Kronstadt we're, tree. We're sending the we're sending the tree of heaven to hell. <laughs> I'm on the tree way to hell. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that more in a in a in a few slides. We'll talk about that some more. Okay, so um, when we think about forests in the eastern United States, we got to go back to the Wisconsin glaciation because uh, that's a couple of miles of ice that covered the east coast from seventy or sorry seven thousand. 75,000 years ago to about 11,000 years ago. So it's like, you know, most of the Eastern US covered in forest or covered, that's covered in forest today, covered in ice, like three or four miles thick of ice. And what's not covered in ice is like, you know, you get a nice permafrost. So what you think of like Canada and the Canadian shield forest kind of look like today, that's what our forest used to look like that weren't impacted by glaciers. So cool. the force that we see today is kind of new on a geological time frame. Man, remember glaciers? Yeah, we used to have uh, those. We used to have them. We don't have them anymore. going to be tough explaining those to, to people younger than us. Oh, uh, yeah, it's a shame. Hey, so the world used to be inhabitable and now it's not. Yeah. Hey, Gen Z doesn't remember when we lived under three or four miles of ice. <laughs> oh, God, do you remember? <laughs> and the ice vampires? Yeah. And then 9-11 happened. Yeah, when the now, I that, now I have to have a ticket just to look at the planes, a bunch of fucking Nazis. <laughs> <laughs> I have to take off so, his shoes to get on the glacier. That would be inadvisable, I think. I have a friend who just got back from time in Antarctica, and it sounds like it's not a great place to live. But you know who did live on glaciers for a long time? Were the various first peoples who used to live in America. So, um, oh wait, next slide, please. Sorry. Yes. All right, so the so so America has been you know inhabited by people for a really long time. So you get your first peoples coming over, you know, like sixteen thousand years ago. So here, pictured here, is the Meadowcroft site uh, in Pennsylvania, outside of Pittsburgh. Um, I'm not an anthropologist or an archaeologist, so we're just gonna like use the numbers that they generate. I and mean, if you it's could wrong, be like it, it's it, you're not expressing anyone's like official views. You could just lie very easily and be like, I, "I am also." Oh, an we believe you too. We believe you yeah. too. We're yeah. very, we're very <laughs> malleable, gullible. I actually have seven PhDs. <laughs> <laughs> I just have one, but it's my pretty huge dick, and. Um... <laughs> Okay, so so this is Meadowcroft. Um, they have found arrowheads here that date back to between sixteen thousand years ago and maybe nineteen thousand years ago or thirteen thousand years ago. I don't know. We know that there are definitely people in New Mexico thirteen thousand years ago. So if we take those numbers, we take sixteen to thirteen thousand years ago. That means people lived on glaciers for at least five thousand years. 
We're talking. Oh man! You know, Every time you think about the like sort of longer time scale of anthropology, it sucks to be like, oh yeah, people not just lived entire lives, entire generations, two thousand years of like, yeah, it's gonna be a, it's, it's a glacier. That's what it is. It's gonna stay this way forever. And then you skip, you fast forward a bit because you like you know get bored with the glacier, and then Pittsburgh is there. Like wh yeah. <laughs> what? What the fuck? Pretty quickly too. Yeah. We can yeah. jump from from glaciers to Pittsburgh pretty quickly. Okay, so we, so we got people here. They're, they're here for a long time. Um, eventually, the glaciers melt and the forests go north. So uh, by 8,000 years ago, you kind of see, you know, in Pennsylvania, the forest that we're looking at in this picture. That's about when most of that shows up. We're going to talk about what happens, why this is only kind of a representation of what our forest should look like in a few slides. Um, because of that glacial retreat, we do have a few northern remnant species here that, like, probably shouldn't be here, like red spruce. Uh, and then if you go into the southwest, like uh, Aspen is kind of a hangover from when it was a lot more temperate down there. Uh, and that's, that's having problems now from, you know, climate change. But mm. so this, this is how we definitely know glaciers were here in case anyone's like, oh, are glaciers real? It's like, well, we have a tree that probably really shouldn't be so, in most of Pennsylvania or wasn't glaciated. Contemporaneously, uh, guys building the pyramids and in the future Pittsburgh, a uh, guy is telling his kid, uh, you, you know, you got pronouns now. You don't even know what glaciers were like. The glaciers were fake. This tree was introduced by the Tartarian <laughs> civilization. <laughs> <laughs> well, well. Speaking of civilizations, next slide, next slide, please. Oh, it's a mistake. Oh, uh, ah, oh. boo! <laughs> <laughs> ah. Oh, this looks like my palace in Civ Three. Interesting, and yet you live in society. Yeah. <laughs> so, do you guys know what we are looking at here? Yeah, it's Cahokia. Don't look at the notes. We're looking no, at I, East I, St. I Louis. I, I knew this off the dome. <laughs> this is this is like uh, mound building Mississippian civilizations, uh, the yes. largest uh, like inhabited site in North America for like until probably Philadelphia. Like and yet and and yet they did it in East St. Louis, yes. the worst city in America. <laughs> <laughs> East, return with the V. Return uh, St. Louis to this. Yeah. <laughs> Build the mounds. Rebuild the mounds. Well, there were some mounds in St. Louis proper, um, but they were excavated for fill material. For fuck's sake. You hate to sake. see that. There's one that it. has a house on top, still. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's house mega haunted. haunted. Yeah. That yeah. is a very haunted house, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where I went to Boy Scout camp in Wisconsin, we had a couple of mounds, and they were really cool. Uh, and they were very much a no-go place, and there was lots of fun ghost stories about them. I am mounds, barrows, corgans, that's all that's all mega haunted stuff. It's it's fun that like the way these accumulated is just like you build a temple, you want to build a bigger temple, so you build it around the first temple, and you keep doing that a couple of hundred times until you get a mound with a temple on the top of it. It's great. Yeah, we've been doing it for a long time. Doing it all over the yeah. world. Classic, classic dude thing right there. Dude's just love. <laughs> Well, I heard Dude, from the digging. cultural tutor that um, oh, actually Christ. this was all somehow related uh, to the Egyptians, yeah. uh, who spread their it's, culture. It's all sort of like I, one yeah, but... one great sort of tradition. The tradition of this is how you build stuff that doesn't fall down for a long time. Actually, relatively easy to make a big pile of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tell it to the like. Um, tell it to the Egyptian serfs. Uh, before the in serf, introduction of Seft and whatever. They, 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 they figured out how to get that thing built out of stone real fucking quick. Um, yeah. Somehow. Aliens. <laughs> they aliens, enlisted yeah. the help of the aliens. And you yes. know what? We're, we're barely doing that at all these days. I yeah. assume. Pyramids couldn't be just a really cool shape that stays up for a while. That would be impossible. Impossible. <laughs> no, no way. No way that would be resistant to uh, most natural forces. <laughs> <laughs> So we, we have Cahokia, we have remnants of Cahokia, what hasn't been flattened and turned into St. Louis and other, you know, Western European settlement kind of things. Um, we have, you know, lots of people in the U.S. Um, I think the Mississippian mound building culture got into Pennsylvania a little bit, but we had a bunch of other cultures of people. I mean, we're talking again, like 13 to, you know, 16 to 13,000 years of settlement. So we're going to miss some folks in there. The archaeological record yeah, is so good. The whole Book of Mormon happened in this period, too. Like, <laughs> it's, of, it's easy to get. 
the, the, the civilization sort of devolved into uh, what we would now call the Natchez tribe, I believe. Um, you know, so they, that was sort of uh, uh, they, they they have sort of this distinct uh, cultural legacy from like uh, the Iroquois speaking or the Algonquin speaking tribes, which are further east, to my knowledge. Um, <laughs> Although sure. calling them a Mississippian culture, although literally, geographically, historically true, does make me think of them all talking like Falcon Lycon. And I apologize for that, <laughs> but I, I can't shake the idea of like being human sacrifice, having people, my like... <laughs> indigenous having, peoples just talking with the <laughs> thickest draw you ever did Yeah, here. yeah, yeah. I, I get like the heart torn out of my chest and get like rolled down the mound, uh, you know, by a guy who talks like Falcon Lycon. Or Are even telling- better, some guy in the, in the, in the Mississippi Delta who's uh, our <laughs> subgroup of rednecks that only speak French. Yeah. They speak a, a French form of um, notches. I yeah. don't know. I don't it's, know the, where I'm the going The accent is found in the soil. <laughs> yeah. It's endemic yeah. to the landscape. You, you merely adopt it. <laughs> it takes it takes it becomes you so mm. so we have people here we got like you know depending on the estimate in north america between three and eighteen thousand people before the europeans show up so we got a lot of people you know some places million, some, right? yes yeah million did i say million you said thousand which is like oh uh, yeah very oh. funny to be like yeah we got oh. like eighteen thousand dudes in north america <laughs> <laughs> well, that's how a lot of people think that we did, but oh, we, sure, we, it was yeah. pretty well settled, pretty well settled, uh, pretty well happened, you know, habited and populated. There's some interesting work that's coming out now about how, like, the extinction curves, the amount of extinction that goes on kind of falls off right after the Ice Age. Um, so, you know, you can make arguments that, like, you know, maybe the First Nations, like, killed off all the, li- the wildlife or the glaciers killed stuff off. But it seems like, you know, they kind of figured stuff out. So pretty hmm. smart, really good at managing the landscape around them. You know, they harvest trees to make these settlements, cut down trees to grow on this, crops. You can you can read the Book of Mormon um, yes. and, and find out <laughs> exactly what went down with these guys. Uh, <laughs> the First Nations also really like burning stuff because it's fun and it's mm-hmm. cool. Oh, yeah, dude, it's rock. For real. You, you, yeah. you, you make a, like big heaps of shit. You uh, you know maybe do a little bit of human sacrifice on the side, and you set some big fires. I mean, it, it's a, that's a good time, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not sure how much human sacrifice you know they did. I don't know. I couldn't tell you. Well, I don't want to be Mississippian culture. I believe did human sacrifice, but it was sort of unique in North America in doing that. Um. <laughs> And to be fair, human sacrifices usually deserved it. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> That's you know, a joke. I, you know, you know, this is this is uh, why We're the little ice age occurred. Somehow. Is you know they, mm. you know, some of these cultures stopped doing human uh, sacrifice, and then the sun didn't come up as strong. Yeah, the next God day. got mad. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> keep, keep, keep. You gotta keep going, man. Yeah, that's a little ice age right yeah. there. We solved that one. Figure that yeah. one out. Yeah, okay, exactly. So, we so started they're to here, they're do uh, all these kinds of. Uh, military interventions and all of a sudden now we have global warming we're doing too much of it now <laughs> <laughs> just a fine you just need a, just a light war on terror constantly not, yeah. not the full global war well, a little bit just like we'll, a flower we'll war on terror <laughs> yeah so so they're they're out here managing landscapes we know that they are we know like in ohio and wisconsin and parts of pennsylvania they manage specifically for baroque it's got a really big acorn and it you know fruits regularly it's what you call acorns is fruiting um or masting if you want to be cool so it fruits are massed regularly and they they used to eat that i've tried acorns not a huge fan i think it's kind of a cultural thing what are you gonna do you got enriched flour and sugar that beats a lot of things in nature um the it's also really good for into it. oh i love mm. squirrel squirrel's pretty tasty yeah squirrel is pretty good yeah big fan and then they, and you don't they have burn to like um, nixtamalize it either. You don't have to like, um, you know, like process it in saliva or whatever either, which I bet is helpful. Yeah, I think you just leach it in water. Yeah. I've only had <laughs> acorn once. It's it's fine. So so they manage the land for a long time, and you know they managed every the humans touched every acre and every foot of land in the United States. You know, for thousands of years, well before you know, Europeans show up, but then Europeans show up, they do a couple of genocides, 
you know, I think that we can Lions of Lions of My Donkeys is a good series on the King's King Films War. Excuse Thank me, you. that you can check out if you want to learn more about that. Thank you um, for advertising my own podcast to me. <laughs> <laughs> you heard of this? Yeah. Hey, yeah, you got to you got to take the experts sometimes. Uh, so so you check so you so you do a couple of genocides, you kill them off, um, and then people westerners like they start going west and they're like oh like there's this whole wilderness thing there's virgin forest you know this untouched landscape it's not true you just killed everyone who used to be there mm. and know, sometimes so. without knowing you were killing them you like the disease comes yeah. ahead of you kills a bunch of people you walk in see like a, a a nicely sort of curated piece of geoengineering or whatever and you're like man it's crazy that god did this for us Yes. Yeah, when it was really Francois kissing somebody like ten years before, who like you know moved mm. uh, smallpox all around. It was it's always really everywhere. grim. Like any any sort of like narratives, uh, particularly in uh, in Mexico, if you if you like read about the Spanish conquest, where it's like uh, all of the sort of like political decision making there is like yeah, it's going pretty well. One guy's got a cough. We're not going to worry about that. Uh, and then <laughs> yeah, you like yeah. you, you lose the thread a bit. You fast forward a bit everyone's fucking dead the sun is as blood <laughs> right yes yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah you go from like a population oh. of like 35 million down to like handfuls mm. craziness okay and all of a sudden so, you don't have enough people to sacrifice it starts getting cold <laughs> <laughs> that's what i'm saying <laughs> <laughs> see you you your buddy and another guy you're all looking at each other all right who's going on the mound I love the idea of Ross being like human sacrifice coordinator for an indigenous civilization. Just with like a clipboard and a hard hat, like prodding at people being like, hey, hey, how you feeling? Hey, you got a, hey, are you tracking? Hey. (laughs) Yeah, I've got a bunch of thermometers around the, uh, around the, uh, the the country, you know, it's like, okay, okay, we got to kill a guy here. We got to kill a guy here. We got to not kill a guy there. That's a little bit too much. Like, oh, rainfall. No, no, that's no good. Like, exit off. Like, it's not (laughs) playing. Ah, that place is real bad. We got to kill, we got to sacrifice a couple virgins. Like, the Uh, whole village at some point. (laughs) Calling a guy up. Hey, you know, I really, you really got to work hard on your quality control here. I see you pulling the hearts out. You're getting one, two beats. You really should get at least five, six out of that heart. Come on now. We can do Send that. me the hearts. Send me the hearts. OSHA, OSHA for uh, human sacrifice. You guys keep cutting their hands. Yeah. Problem. Yeah. Yeah, you gotta have like the oyster glove. Uh, yeah. You know. I you gotta build a it. tiny scratch. <laughs> You know, I, 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 I got to If these people had better administrative states, they would have, you know, they would have lasted longer. That's all. I gotta, it's, gotta it's hard to do. It's hard to do human sacrifice. You know? <laughs> it's it's hard to do human sacrifice OSHA when you're doing it in like knots and strings or like stone <laughs> like stone wheels. Right. Yeah, you really have to have like a paper industry to really like help you with this. And that's yeah. just like not to get to like guns, germs, and steel, right? But that's that's one of the things that it's like, oh man, one of those innovations really hampers your ability to control your human sacrifice levels. Well the nice thing about using stone tablets or everything everything down is like, you know, when you get down to it, you can just brain someone with a stone tablet. Yeah, that's true. One in doubt, absolutely just murk a guy with a tablet. <laughs> yeah, what, what are you going to do with paper? You could give someone like a really bad paper cut. It's really not cutting out. Paper you know? cut. <laughs> so, so, you know, what a lot of people have liked in their minds is what these forests look like. It's not an accurate representation of forests. Really, your age structure is probably 20% young forest. Six, so young forest is a forest that's, you know, a field to like a 20-year-old stand. So you have like thin trees in there. You see a mysteries, but they're not like nice big trees. Then you have a mature forest, which is anywhere from 20 to 340 ish years old. And then you get old growth. Old growth isn't defined by age. Age is just a number when it comes to trees. We have to remember that trees don't have time frames. They have sizes and maturities based on that. So, you know, old growth is like 400 years plus 20 percent. So you look at 20, 60, 20 on your time frame or on your forest structure. And we, we can kind of figure this out through like, you know, wildlife populations. You know, if everything was old growth, you wouldn't have young successional forest animals like rabbits, like grouse, you know, golden wing warblers. Those don't exist if you don't have young forest. So we, can, we know that there was stuff going on. And also like disturbance happens in the landscape. Hurricanes come through and knock trees down. You get wildfires, you get bugs. Somebody's got to come through and put in a cornfield. So disturbance happened. Okay, next slide, please. All right. 
then we get way more disturbance happens. Yeah. Oh, that's bad. Yes. <laughs> yep. Yes. Yes. Um, I think this is outside of the Johnstown area, actually. Um, hence the flooding. Oh shit! For more, please listen to "Well, There's Your Problem" episode on the Johnstown Just flood. Advertise my own podcast. We've got <laughs> at least two more episodes on different johnstown's flood coming yeah we're gonna keep i i had a i had a, a, a conversation i'm just gonna go wildly off track here i'm gonna get this oh, podcast please. over two hours if it kills me i'm gonna uh, kill you about uh like what are we gonna do when we get up up to episode like 500 like we're gonna need to start like bribing people to like derail trains and cause yeah. industrial disasters yeah i had this thing that i was doing where i was uh like calling myself an anarchist and telling people to 3d print train derailers that didn't really work out yeah, no, uh, that was that was us. We were just trying to we we're just trying to juice those numbers so we can get bought off by Spotify. Yeah, I did not mm. know you were Naomi Wu from Shenzhen. Uh, <laughs> I wear many. Yeah, hats, I was Ross. spending a lot of time in like in the gym on like arm day. You know. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah I I just like like talking to Karen because she's like well like the money's nice and like you know are you, how long are you guys gonna go and I'm just like until the people cancel all their Patreon subscriptions until yeah, we don't yeah, make yeah. a single goddamn dollar I mean, like the, that's the, why the, I'm pleased to announce <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean the thing is right I, I enjoy doing this I enjoy making the content I enjoy hanging out with my friends for work I enjoy that people seem to like it but also I enjoy paying rent um, yeah. and I, I'm sure I've said this, I've told the story before, but like Kill James Bond, my other podcast, uh, when I started doing that, someone told me, uh, it's so cool that you have uh, like a project with a defined end point because now nothing ever like ends. And I was like, yeah, for sure. Then we ran out of Bond movies and I was like, fuck, we're, we're not, we're not ending the thing. We're just going to keep going. Uh, and <laughs> I, I suspect this is going to be the same way. This, they are going to have to drag us kicking and screaming off the air. Oh yeah, yes. yeah, no, absolutely. I, I will be down do to think the it's dregs, funny. like the uh, real dregs. So <laughs> I, uh, I got, uh, I got laid off a couple weeks ago, uh, from my nine hmm. to five. Uh, if you've got a job, uh, WTYP pod at Gmail, hit me up. But <laughs> uh, I was talking to Roz, and I was like, and we were talking, and we were just like hanging out. I was like, you know, what's real fucked up is this is actually my job. Like I should be billing for this, really. Hmm. Yeah. Ow. Did uh, was it Pizza Boy or Milkshake? Yeah, that was Pizza Boy. That cat is just a motherfucker. Oh, yeah. well, evil little shit. I, yeah, but I, he he's so funny because Milkshake will like come up to you and be like, "Hey, like you want to give me pats and scratches?" And you're like, "Yeah, okay." And then fucking Pizza Boy is just looking at you with the eyes of Satan. Pizza like, Boy knows have, exactly how bitch. much human sacrifice needs to happen <laughs> yeah, in these exactly. United yeah. States. Yeah. <laughs> it's Roz with Pizza Boy on his shoulder like Iago from fucking Aladdin being like, no, no, those numbers aren't right. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason the Egyptians didn't worship cats. Yeah, yeah they were supervisors. Yeah. <laughs> if, if I may be so bold, Alice, I think that the Cars 2 episode of Kill James Bond is perhaps the peak of podcasting. I don't Thank think it you. really gets much better than that. Thank you so um, much. We're, we're gonna but, we're gonna take that that sort of like quality and we're gonna like really like hammer it into the ground. We are extracting perfect. every drop of surplus value from that because I it turns out I owe this guy called my landlord money to live in my apartment even though it's unbelievable absolute dog shit. So yeah, yeah. I mean, whom's among us? Whom's among us? Yeah. Well, so I, I do chose something Johnstown about all here. Guys. I chose the Johnstown area because I used to work around the Johnstown area. Um, really great forest now, but when we look at this picture, not a lot of trees on that hillside. That hillside Looks is like pretty the bare. Yeah, of Scotland. Uh, which yeah, is well, to say it's the same thing kind of happened there. Yeah, it's the same kind of thing there. I'm not super up on European forestry. I was in England this summer for a wedding, and your your forest made me sad, Alice. <laughs> Maybe sad. It was like We've... a windrow, and they were like, "This is a forest," and I was like, "What? Yeah. What? This is a forest?" Yeah, it's real sad. I mean, one thing I will say, particularly about Scotland, is that we we have our moments of sort of like reforestation and like rewilding and stuff. And you know, it's been a mixed bag. We're not doing nearly as much as uh, as we should be if, if either. But you can get a couple of cool before and after photos where it's like the sort of moonscape gorse. Uh, shit that we have like most of the country or most of the highlands 
on, on the one side and on, and on the right it looks like fucking you know disney princess forest it's great um and it's like that that you know took five years or whatever and it's like yeah we could just do a bunch more of that uh Teresa, if you could say one thing about them they're very good at growing and they're very resilient well that's two things you could say two things about trees <laughs> i think you guys use a lot of doug fur out there though so i would find yeah. native tree species but hey i'm not a scottish forester i work in you know the mid-atlantic so what do i know about scotland <laughs> okay all it's right back on track. yeah hmm. yeah getting back on track so <laughs> yeah. so we get these we get these westerners who show up they farm differently you establish a lot of fields you, you do a lot of cutting do a lot of burning. Um, all of the old growth hemlock comes down. Uh, it comes down not well, for the, the wood, but for the bark. poison people now? <laughs> yeah. Wait hemlock. around for sarin, get, for sarin to be invented? Other hemlock. You can just go to the chemist and like get some arsenic and you know just well, put it in whatever. No, I'm you not worried some... about it. I, I'm sure I could poison someone fine. You have yeah. a really nasty poison ivy rash. Oh, I'm mm. very allergic to the poison ivy. Is... The last time I got poison ivy, I got it on my eyelids. It was fucking horrible. Oh, fuck. Ooh, Jesus. Yeah. So the last time I got poison ivy, I went to the doctor's office. And I was leaking fluid down my leg. And the admin mm. was like, oh, that's bad. And then the nurse came in. She's like, oh, that's bad. And the doctor came in. And he was like, oh, that's bad. I was like, wow, thanks, guys. I'm leaking fluid onto your floor. I didn't know that. Yes, I concur. <laughs> it's bad. Now give me the fucking painkillers, please. Or whatever exactly. it is that I have to do. And they had to give me some steroids, which was fun. Okay, so so they cut down the hemlock, the eastern hemlock, which is different from poison hemlock. Do we do have poison hemlock? Thank you, Europe. We will get to invasive species later. So cut down the hemlock. They become tannins to tan leather. Um, I'm not going to lie. Seeing that would probably make me cry. Just these huge trees getting cut up just for bark. And just, you know, huge trees left in the woods just for the bark. Um, the mass, like the biggest waste after like using sequoias for toothpicks, right? Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of things that I'd like to go back in time if I had a time machine to change. A lot of things there. This is probably right up there, right up there. I'm probably, I'm probably killing baby Hitler, but you do. Yeah, yeah. I was about to say may, yeah. may, maybe killing baby Hitler would be number one, but then we get to this. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Look, if I have a time machine, lots of other people have time machines. I'm not getting in a line to kill Hitler here. No, it's just me. <laughs> yeah. What am I gonna like, do? Like, go, going around the block and like brown now I'm in and like 1899. Is that a cat? Oh yeah, that's my cat. He's very upset that I closed the door. Show us the cat. What's okay, your cat's name? It's Bradley. He's not on oh. video. Kevin, you don't have to show us the cat. Oh, Jesus Christ. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. What? What, Roz? Kevin oh. has been compromised to a permanent end. Yeah. Probably not. He's still there. He's he just sounded bad. blocking my access to the keyboard. Yeah, mm. and he hates you. This is a very feline sort of dominated podcast. Okay, he's say. a little orange guy. You want me to turn my camera on? Yes, yeah, just for oh, a second. Just for a second. Okay, this is Bradley. Oh, yes! Oh, look at Bradley! Him. He's my dumb guy. Aw. Oh, yes. Adorable. Okay, He's thank you, Kevin. Kevin. Guy. All right, we're good. All right, He's we're just good. so nice. We, I have a second cat, Belle, and she um, likes to pretend that she doesn't like me, but she really loves me. But she likes my wife a lot more. Such is the nature <laughs> of cats. That is how it works. That's why, you know... Roz's cats uh, fight over his tummy. Yeah. It's, this is the true, year yeah. is 2023. Tummies are now battlefields. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, okay, Bradley, you have to get off the keyboard. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Doing great. Doing great. My apologies, a, Devin, for podcast. editing all the sound there. Okay. Okay. So, so we cut, we're cutting down the big trees. Hemlocks are going to make tannins. White pine is going to make uh, Pittsburgh. They're going to make the city of Pittsburgh. Or to make Bradley relax, buddy. Or uh, to make just, uh, ships. Very passionate about the city of Pittsburgh. Yes. Yeah, he he really feels it. Um, the white pine, you know, it's a really big, straight, tall tree. It's we call it a super canopy tree because it can get to be 150 feet tall, and so you make masts out of that. Um, mm. And then the hardwoods in the forest, you turn to the side of the ship. You know, famously, old iron sides. Her sides have made of iron made of uh, eastern white oak, growing here in the United States. So that's where all our forests go. Uh, and then we also give, make charcoal. This is kind of one thing that we forget about Pennsylvania, but we made a lot of charcoal in this state. Yeah, I don't call it a commonwealth. That's ridiculousness. Um, so, <laughs> oh, fuck yourself. 
<laughs> Sorry, I was burping midway through saying that. <laughs> so a charcoal hearth um, is a place where they burned charcoal. They burned wood to make charcoal. They ate a one could use at least an acre of forest a day. And like these things were active for decades. Um, so they're running through a lot of land. Uh, every almost every acre of Pennsylvania is clear cut between four and six times from like, you know, 1800 until today. Uh, it kind of depends like, on how close you are to a charcoal hearth. That's mostly for steel, right? Or is that? Um, yeah. Yep. A lot okay. of it goes to steel. Uh, a lot of it goes to firing the, the uh, lime or the coke kilns. Uh, and then you also got to cook with something, too. So it goes into all kinds of stuff. Like a similar but, yeah, thing happens in Britain, I think. Mm, yeah. Well, I think it starts earlier. <laughs> well, yeah. and unlike Britain, we're just built different. We could handle it. <laughs> you can just keep going west, find more trees. Sure. Yeah, right. You don't, you don't have to like divert heavily into a coal mining industry. You know, you just do oh, that we anyway. Got those two. You do, yeah, you <laughs> do that. You we do both. Fight, because that one, yeah. Sort of a maximalist country. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and then you don't just keep going on coal, even though it's clearly done. You, you don't do that. That would be silly. Yeah, shut up. That would Worry be about silly. It. Yeah, we're don't, bringing don't anthracite look over there. back. It's clean. It's clean coal, folks. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry so, about the sulfur dioxides. Uh, <laughs> I never do. By the end of the 1800s, you go from Pennsylvania goes from 99% forest down to 30%, which is a lot of work for dudes with axes and saws. That's a lot of work. You got to hand it to them. They they went out there and they did that. And that's mostly young forest. There's very extraordinarily little old growth forest left in the whole state. You know, you can count them off. There's like Cook's Forest, World's End, and a couple other spots, but very little is left. You also, in the process of, you know, civilizing the West, you exterminate wolves, mountain lions, wolverines, almost kill off deer, and uh, pine martens and fishers got exterminated um, and driven to extinction. We almost did that to turkeys and black bears too, but we still have turkeys, black bears, and deer, luckily. You do a similar mm. thing to the plant community. Uh, and so we're doing this for a good while until next slide, please. Famously, the Dust Bowl Me happens. reaping, or rather me not reaping. Yeah. Yes. Yes, that would be the problem. That would be the problem. Um, now, obviously, in Pennsylvania, you don't get, you know, as big of a problem, but you get a lot of farm abandonment. And the really fun thing about Pennsylvania is the ground wants to be trees. So the forest starts to bounce back until, next slide, please, you get this. Does anyone know what this is? Ugh. No, this is this I is a, a of me, like so I do. fucked up yeah, tree bark, yeah. but I'm, pre yes. I'm pretending not to know because I'm not looking down at the notes. Yeah, no, that's fine. About, this I, is some I, body I, horror right here. Yes, mm. so this is chest. There's a light. lot of body horror in trees, huh? I mean, they don't really have bodies, so yeah. Oh, no, there's like a I mean, really stuff fun... that like looks horrifying when you like uh, um, so mentally translate it to a human context because we're anthropocentric, you know, brained animals. Yeah, there's a really fun. Um, fungus, it's not, it's not oak apple, or sorry, it's not cedar apple fungus, it's not oak apple, but there's one that looks like a, like an octopus is coming out of a tree, I'm forgetting, the name is escaping me right now, but there's some mm. weird stuff out there with trees. Um, but the trees aren't usually the ones doing it, it's usually the stuff attacking the trees. So this is chestnut blight. Chestnut blight is a non-native fungus, it's native to Asia, if anyone's really curious. Um, though, weirdly, when you talk about invasive species, people tend to get kind of racist. When you talk about mm. invasives, they get into like the whole like, oh, like, you know, someone did this to us. And like, usually no, usually like it's the person who imported its fault. You know, no, no one in China purposely packed up a tree with blight and sent it over here. You, or someone spotted bought it. lantern fly. Oh, we will get to that. <laughs> yes, we'll get to SLF. We'll get there. OK, so this shows up in 1905 um, and by 1940, maybe 1950. You know, you pick your expert. Uh, all the chestnut, well, almost all the chestnut in America are dead. So that we're going to have a really nice body count in this episode. So right now I'm going to win at, you know, total organisms killed. We're talking between three and a half and four billion trees dead. Jesus. Done. Jesus. Yep. And like chestnut was like, had like a, a ton of like cultural valence too, right? Like you used the chestnut for a bunch of stuff. It's good, like a, oh, it's yeah. a good street tree and stuff. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, the... I, Chestnuts roasting on an open fire. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jack and that song was written when it was native, native chestnut. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so you lose this incredibly valuable tree from, you know, a human perspective. The food is valuable. The bark was used in tannins. It was really important for wildlife species. 
also was really great to fatten up pigs for free on. You know, you just run them under the chestnuts when they're masting. And it's like masted almost every year, unlike our oak species. Like white oak will produce acorns like almost every, like every eight years if it's not happy. So this is a huge loss. And the timber is super valuable. I found one report that estimated that in 1909, uh, I can't remember if it was the U.S. timber industry or just the Pennsylvania timber industry lost $20 million in 1909 dollars due to chestnut blight, which I converted it just for fun. That's about $594 million today. It was one year. <laughs> so, yeah. so the loss of the species from the timber industry, in pra- you know, incalculable. And the real question we get to start grappling here is how do you value a species? Well, I mean, we can put a, we can put a sort of like we can tie it to the the market there, as we just did. We can see how much it makes, how much difference it makes to the big line, right? Yeah, um, I mean, you could. No, but, but uh, you how, know, how do you most... do it? I, I would like to know. This is a serious question. Hmm. Oh. I don't know. I couldn't tell you, but I spent a lot of time thinking about trees. So to try to figure that out is not great. Uh, we still have some chests on the landscape today. They're kind of doing like the you know, the Tom Cruise Edge of Tomorrow movie where they grow and they die and then they come back and they grow and they die and they come back. We haven't mm. found any that have been able to reproduce on their own. Uh, there are attempts at backbreeding chestnut with Chinese chestnut. It kind of works. It kind of doesn't. There's a really promising modified chestnut um, out there, which we can talk more about if you want, but um, yeah, that's, sure. that's under I, approval I read, right now. I read an interesting article looking at like the sort of like hunt for like individual like survivor chestnut trees or like stands of trees sure. and like trying to uh y- you know d- it, like develop some kind of like indigenous chestnut resistance rather than like back breeding um and and that sort of like not working for the most part yeah every few months people get really excited because they find a big chestnut it's like they're out there you can find you know chestnut that are either resistant or haven't been attacked for some reason i don't care about the adults what i care about are is reproduction. And if you look underneath those chestnut, you don't find reproduction. So it's not, you know, genetically transferable. Whatever mm. is keeping that tree alive is not moving on to the next generation. And that's kind of a problem. That's where like this whole thing is just kind of a waste of time. Mm. In my, you know, personal opinion. This is always the one of the things that got me interested in this subject is um my God, like a quarter of the forest was just murdered and yeah. there's barely any like even cultural memory of it. Oh, um, it'll get worse. Don't worry. I have, I have <laughs> like way funner ones than just this. It's going to get worse before it gets better. <laughs> but that's in like four slides. That's in like four slides. That's why I drink at night. Um, anyway. <laughs> um, and my drinking is maybe imperiled soon. We'll see. Oh, no. um, at the same time, as you get chestnut blight, you also get butternut blight. So you have towns that are like named butternut. You have butternut squash. It's named after the tree butternut or white walnut. Also dead. Um, I've seen, excuse me, three uh, white walnuts and they've all been in decline. So, you know, this tree is, oh, this tree even has less cultural valence than chestnut. Like I used to hunt in a place called butternut and no one knew why it was called butternut. They're like, oh, it's just the, is it the squash? It's like, no, it's the tree. It's the tree. It's the tree. <laughs> gone all right next slide please okay okay so the forest keeps growing the nice thing about forests especially in the eastern united states is their states is they're pretty resilient um so we keep growing despite the loss of two pretty important you know overstory species like we said chestnut may have been anywhere between 20 and 40 percent of the overstory depending on where you are and who you believe so we're down those, but we have mainly an oak hickory forest. Oh, we also lost the passenger pigeon, which has got yes. some really interesting ecological impacts. Like the flocks are so big, they broke branches and they broke trees, which ca- caused like holes in the canopy the for fuck? like oaks and stuff to recruit into. Really neat. That that is that is also a wild like loss right there. How do we yeah, exactly. lose mm-hmm. the passenger pigeon? My a billion God. of them, right? What? I think that was oh, yeah. multiple billions. That. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, my terminology was not great. Uh, we killed them. They were yeah, driven yeah. to extinction. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No, you're it's, fine. It's, it's, yeah, we, it's, we, it's, we it's murdered all to, of them. <laughs> it's, it's grim to think that we're going to do this with a bunch of like more important to us, cuter, more memorable species, but all of the auguries from like previous experience shows that we won't remember or care. And, you know, right. it'll be like, yeah, polar bears, whatever, you know? 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we did it with the great auk. We had the Carolina parakeet. We did it mm-hmm. with the ivory bill woodpecker. We did it with the passenger pigeon. Carolina you know. had parakeets. Yeah. The Carolina parakeet. It was the only parakeet native to North America. Wow. It was really neat. Shit. Really cool bird. You can see some skins that they have at the um, National History Museum. That's depressing. <laughs> yeah. I like yeah. I, I, I read ahead in the notes so that only gets worse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I told you I drink at night. All right. Like this is this is not always fun. Sometimes I get to have fun, but not most days I have a bad day. <laughs> no, I hear that. OK, so so our forest keeps growing um, and now we are going to jump forward to today just to kind of place us in time. So today, if you look at your average Pennsylvanian forest, this is kind of what it looks like. It's an oak hickory forest. It's pretty mature. It's 60 plus years old. There's very little future forest out there. When we look forward to, you know, what your next generation of forest is, you got like 7% young forest and we want to be at 20. The other problem is, is if you are an organism that likes a young forest, like a golden wing warbler, you got nowhere to live. If you are the monarch butterfly who wants to live on milkweed, milkweed does not grow in a closed canopy. You don't have plants to live on. You don't have anywhere to live. You die. So, mm. Well, the housing crisis, you know, I guess yeah, everyone. I was about to well, say, yeah. if you just zoned for forest, it would be fine. <laughs> got to do it. <laughs> we got to zone for young forest, though. We can't, we can't yeah. zone for this mature forest. You know, this, yeah. you know, historical uh, properties got to go. Got to go. <laughs> so you can make young forest by harvesting old forest. Um, the, the thing when you harvest a forest you cut the trees down and you're trying to let the trees underneath them grow your next generation of forest. Um, so when we look at what's underneath those trees here, we have a really nice regen pocket. You have little trees in here. They're going to take over. Uh, that's not representative of most of Pennsylvania's forest. Next slide, please. And this is why this is a white tail deer. This motherfucker. You got to, you got to start killing. Oh. It's time yes. to start yes. the yes. killing. It's time to start uh. the killing. <laughs> You little bastard, you ruined Bambi, my garden. Bambi, we're coming for you. Yeah. <laughs> and Bambi's mom. We're going to raise you from the dead and kill you again. <laughs> yeah. This is right next to a highway. Um, so that one really just wanted to jump in front of a truck and get killed. Deer, deer, are, su- deer are absolutely suicidal. Yeah. Uh, like, yep. Oh, for sure. Oh, my God. I've, 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 uh, so a friend of a friend of my husband's, um, uh, his parents had uh, like a yard with a ravine off to one side of it, and they oh, built no. a wall covering that ravine, you know, so so as you didn't fall in the ravine. And deer used to, like, deer can jump remarkably high, for one thing. Um, so they would just, like, get in over part of this wall, you know, not related to the ravine, to eat the flowers, grass, whatever, um, kill all of the plants in the garden by pissing on them. Uh, and then the second you notice that there are a shitload of deer in your garden, you like, Flip the light on over. Every deer goes, Oh fuck, I'm gonna die. Runs, sprints in the direction of the wall, jumps over it directly into the ravine. It's like a buffalo drop. Like it's littered <laughs> with deer carcasses, and you just have a ravine full of dead deer <laughs> next to your house. And you're just like, the, f- what the fuck am I? And this happened like regularly. Deer are not <laughs> smart animals. No, 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 no. No, uh, no. Uh, yeah. Liam and I witnessed the deer run into I ninety five and get just trucked by an SUV. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, it was really, we did, and we didn't get killed because of my tremendous driving. Yes, this is true. Liam is Thank very you. good at driving. Slow down. Uh, here's, <laughs> here's my deer car story. One time, I was driving in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Um, I, mean, I was driving to go to a race. I was running, and um, it was, it was a running race. And in one like three hour drive, I killed two deer. Wow. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah, Good yeah, for you, you. Got to get one of them with a door. <laughs> <laughs> uh, basically. So the first one was a little fawn that was a little bit slow and I broke its back leg. Uh, oh. I could feel like it crunch underneath the wheel. And like there are wolves and winter up there. So that one wasn't going to make it to the winter. It's fine. You have compensatory mortality. It probably wasn't going to make it anyways. And the second one, that one just it was just like I'm I'm done with life because it just put his head down in front of the bumper of my Jeep and it was just like toast, just neck oh. snap. Didn't even damage. Well, I broke, I cracked a wit the headlight. I had no damage on the car. I was like, what did you do, buddy? No one made you do this. 
Deer are fucking stupid. If there's one thing you need to know from this podcast, it's that deer are fucking stupid. Yeah, and you also have you also have to like Home Bambi did a disservice mm. to yes. um, deer control by making deer cute. Um, they're, 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 they're like bastards. terrifying animals. They can they can fuck you up too. Like if you're just on foot, they can like they're sharp hooves. They can trample you, and fucking stab you and shit. Uh, but also the other thing about deer is that. It, it's one of the rare times when having a cool time with firearms is a socially responsible thing to do. Um, because hunting deer can be like one of the only ways of stopping them from overpopulating, killing all the plants and trees, and then starving to death. Yeah, you need uh, yeah. you need to have a gun that also fires Agent Orange. When I mm. was uh, a uh, child, yeah, I ran into Agent a, Orange. I, I, I ran into a deer on my bike. <laughs> I like how flat that was, but he just He's ran okay. out yeah. into the bike trail at mm -hmm. uh, South One South Run Recreational Center in Burke, Virginia. There's a steep downgrade. You could ride your bike down. It was really fun. I got to the bottom. There was a deer that just ran out into the trail, and then I smacked right into the side of it, and um, I fell over, and um, the deer fell over. And the deer got up and ran away, and I got up and was like, "You fucking bastard!" <laughs> <laughs> Little seven-year-old Roz, just like you piece of shit. Yeah, I'm I think I was only like, twelve or so. <laughs> the thing is, right? The we can't always rely. You know on... what else? It happened again when I was commuting to work when I was twenty-two or so. Uh, that was at Cobb's yeah. Creek Park. I did not run into the deer, but I almost did. <laughs> But we can't we Very can't rely incredible. on like outside things like uh you know rows on a bicycle or you know wolves that we've reintroduced or whatever. Like you gotta you gotta get out there and you gotta do the like cool thing and you just gotta we all have deer. personal yeah. vendettas against deer. No, <laughs> Alice, in all seriousness, that's the main reason why I, I hunt is my my hunting yeah, ethic sure. is not about harvesting you know venison you know not harvesting deer to eat which is tasty and I like it, but it, it's, mm. it's for the forest. You know, I'm a wildlife biologist. I have the, the whole degree and the certifications or whatever, but I'm really, I'm a tree guy at heart. And so I just go out there and I try to kill deer for the forest. And in Pennsylvania, we got like between one and 1. 1.5 million deer, but you got to kill antlerless deer. So this one got to go. You got to kill 40% of antlerless deer annually to make an impact on deer population. Fuck. Mm. Yeah. 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 They're good at wow. that. One. They're good at that one. <laughs> Yeah. Well, so if you think about like the life history, the ecological history of deer, they had a couple of big predators. You had wolves, mountain lions, also called cougars, catamounts, pumas. They had like they have like four different common names, all the same cat. You have uh, wolves, cougars, and humans. Those are your three mm. main deer predators, and we have eliminated two of them. Uh, and wolves and mountain lions aren't coming back to Pennsylvania anytime soon. No, probably Luckily, not going to come back at all. Tool using ape, right? Eugene Stoner yeah. invented the AR-15, <laughs> and you know that we can we can sort of like use it for good, uh, you know, uh, by killing a lot of deer more efficiently yes. than than a mountain lion could. Also, I think you give he... a mountain lion an AR-15, couldn't do shit with it, you know. Yeah, yes. that's, that's <laughs> not that you know, they'll evolve. Yeah. Well, and so here, oh, that, here's that, where I'm gonna put a plug be in. Screwed. <laughs> If you like, don't feel comfortable around guns. You don't have to use guns. You can use crossbows. I use oh, a crossbow. Yeah. I like oh, it a lot fun. more with my rifle. To be very honest, it's quiet, it's lighter, and it's free to shoot. Whereas every time I pull the trigger, it's like that's two fifty. That's two fifty. That's two fifty. <laughs> Plus, I'm you're like this depositing is the like I don't shoot lead a into the environment as well. Like, oh yeah, I, I use non lead ammo. Hmm. Which, like, the, the fucking firearms industry is, like, badly slacking on, is my understanding. Uh, like, yeah. both, like, availability of and development of uh, lead-free uh, ammunition. They're really I mean, availability sort of, of um, ammo is tough. They're mm. really sort of, you know, sort of focusing not on the hunting industry, but on the mass shooting industry, which yeah. I think is a mistake. Because um, <laughs> you, you can mass shoot deer, and people will bring, call you a hero. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, us. Yeah. <laughs> you can be as oh, yeah. antisocial as you like uh, about deer hunting, you know? Big fan. I'm a yeah. big fan of it. 
<laughs> you gotta like, do it for the like, force. For, genuinely, though, like uh, whenever sort of like gun control comes up, you get like democratic politicians be like, um, you know, we don't want to sort of impinge on the rights of the honest, upright, you know, upstanding American sportsman or woman who you know, goes out and, like, shoots one or two deer and, like, you know, makes, you know, cooks the venison or whatever. No, we shouldn't be encouraging that. We should be encouraging the sort of the cultural rancidity of American firearms culture deployed <laughs> exclusively against deer. I shot 40 deer in a day. Yeah. <laughs> well, good for him. <laughs> we did, we that already did New that Zealand. against, like, uh, we did that against bison, and, like, we gotta redress that injustice by doing it against a species that actually has it coming, for once. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to, depending on who you talk to, probably what beat bison back was uh, barbed wire. They did a mm. lot of the damage on bison. Um, they do that in New Zealand, because um, the only native mammals in New Zealand are, like, three species of bat, and so they'll do a lot of aerial gunning on like stags and some of the other species out there. Oh yeah, they're really so into it there. Fucking yeah, that like, I mean, it just I think I think it's sort of like a of shooting the deer from like, a helicopter. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you are a servine, right? Like you, you are a deer with like two brain cells banging together, and we're gonna get to the what those brain cells are doing uh, in in the rest of the slide. But like, and then a guy <laughs> in a helicopter comes and shoots you with a gun, D like. <laughs> That's that's beyond an outside context problem. That's uh, thereby saving over. you from yeah. dying from a prion disease or a ditch yeah. or whatever. I, yeah, mm -hmm. I would say that we put a we put a pin in the prion disease. And we come back to that in like three sentences. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Well, we can get into chronic wasting disease discourse in a moment. We got to finish the shit here, that though. gives me nightmares. Oh yeah. Oh, you and me both. Yeah, you and me <laughs> both. I've had more than a few. Not sleepless nights, but sleep interrupted nights because of it. But we'll get there. That's a later thing. That's a that's a three minutes from now question. Okay, so, so we have all these deer out here. Thoughts. Oh. <laughs> oh. Hey, uh. hey, you know what's you know what's a fun thing to deploy against someone who's got a health anxiety is uh, diseases that like whose transmission is extremely resilient and whose symptoms are extremely nebulous. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's real fun. Oh, Grew up in fun. Britain in the oh, '90s. So, gonna so be paranoid old. about that for the rest of my fucking life. Oh, I'm so. Old. I mean, on the bright side, there's nothing you could do about it. Yeah, that's yeah, just, cool. yeah, that's it. Yeah. It takes usually uh, 50 years for symptoms to manifest. Mm -hmm, or not, cool. I don't think maybe it's 20 years. I can't remember exactly. No one knows. No, double digits. no one. No one knows. Which is. Mm, mm. Uh, yeah, we are all controlled by the prion. <laughs> I would simply not have my uh, you know, proteins unfold. That's what I would do. What we've got to do as a policy prescription here is um, kill a lot of deer, not eat the meat, yeah. and like be it, be the vegetarian uh, deer mass shoot. <laughs> uh, I do this. I do this for ethical reasons. I say as I reload put, put my body. Put it all on a, a twenty. You got to you got to be at least using a thirty odd six. Also yeah. in Pennsylvania, this is the other thing that gets me about hunting discourse. Um, in Pennsylvania, you have to use either pump action, um, lever action, or um, oh, what is my bolt action guns? You can't use semi autos. No, so you we, can't. we, you know, we're, you did, we're you, very weird about it. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's fine. Like if you're going to shoot a deer, you it takes a while to deal with them after you kill them. So you really only need one one shot. Love it's usually fine a, in my love experience. To buck. Love to have fun here. Yeah, okay, so so deer have been overpopulated for a long time, like 30 plus years in Pennsylvania, so they've eaten through everything. I mean, I'm talking like like we had like like lists of like what is non-preferred browse what deer aren't going to eat, because they have small stomachs, so they can't eat everything. Like elk will eat grass. They're a lot more like cows than deer. Deer are what we call selective browsers. And so they've selected through everything they like to eat. They're getting into the stuff they don't like to eat. Um, <laughs> they're changing the forest, like the dominance of the forest. Like you go from like oak oak hickory stands to just like sweet birch because they don't like sweet birch, which is a problem that we'll discuss later. Uh, we've lost a lot of shrub layer in our forest, which has caused a reduction in bird populations. So if you're wondering where some of the, like like Wait, the so bird so decline for, goes, deer. For clarification: Are we're redoing the forest to avoid deer, or they've just chewed through everything? Oh, they've eaten it all. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Thank they you. Eat, thank they you. I wasn't sure. No, no. The, the a lot of the a a lot of regeneration is right there on the screen. It's in that one, and it, it's friends. Mm. 
Okay. Um, so now they're eating things that they don't want to eat. I'd like we've discussed for the last 10 minutes, the only way we can control deer is hunting, particularly with antlerless deer. Um, if you don't like guns, that's fine. It's called archery equipment in the US. I don't think you can use archery equipment in a lot of European states and countries. No, it's, it's not legal here. Yeah, uh, I don't like know bow why. hunting, anything like that is not, it's not legal here. And we have like less restrictive firearm laws for hunting than people tend to think, uh, but like still quite restrictive. Um, I, honestly, my crossbow is the same knockdown power as the rifle. It's fine. It's fine. You are it's humane. It's the same like distance when they don't have a heart. Yeah. You were mm -hmm. hearing it here first from a leftist podcast, folks. Uh, even if you're a vegetarian or a vegan, it is still your duty to go out and kill animals. Yes, <laughs> your moral duty, and we are not joking not animals, about that. One. Like in the ambient, but like deer specifically. Um, like, oh yeah, yeah. No, can't emphasize Acor According enough. to the dictates of your own sort of like local uh, wildlife and forestry criminals. authority. <laughs> okay, yeah, sure, whatever. But do like guerrilla gardening, but just like kill any deer you see. <laughs> I would say legal and ethically harvest them, but uh, you know what? It, it each their own. Each everyone has their own set of ethics. I can't dictate. Your <laughs> ethics. Like, at, the, at this point, they're fucking up the forest so badly that, like, uh, a sort of like a forestry biologist is like, "Yeah, no, you can fucking war crime them if you want. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> I don't give a shit. I am the deer <laughs> commissar. <laughs> <laughs> Not one step back. Um, so we have." <laughs> the Amish do some really interesting drives, which are not always fun to be around if you're not part of the drive. Um, that's a later, that's a, that's a, that's a different story for a different time is what that mm. one is. But there's a lot of lead flying in deer season if you go into some places with some people. Uh, the commissar is less of a joke than we would hope it would be. Um, okay, so so we we had mentioned chronic wasting disease. How much do you how much do you guys want to get into chronic? I do chronic stuff. We could talk about it. We cannot. Up to you. Uh, I want to talk yeah, about sure. it. Yeah. Let's do the body horror. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's, yeah, let's yeah. do the body horror. Okay. Yeah, we, we've talked yeah. about oh. prions before because we talked about them on. Um, God, when did we talk about them? When did we talk? Uh, was it the oh, Therac 25 recall. episode? I think no. it was. I think yeah, it was. I think it was because, yeah. yeah, it came up when I was talking about proteins with Tom. Um, so a, a prion is like a, a misfolded protein. Uh, it, it gives the wrong instructions, and uh, like it's not um, like it's not like a virus. It's not like a bacterium. They're you know they they have kind of a way of persisting on things and in things, and have a very sort of like long latency between when they're around and when you start to like notice the effects. But the effects are horrifying. Um, yes. Correct, Ellis. You get you get bonus points today in your podcasting class. Yeah, all of that's <laughs> <Wow>. right. <laughs> Possible um, to achieve, normal to want. Um, yes. Okay. So so to to add on, so we there are a couple of other known prion diseases. There's scrapie, which is found in uh, sheep and goats. For a while, a long time, we didn't think it could move to humans, but we now believe it can move to humans. We haven't had a case of, you know, we call it in humans it manifests as Krumholtz Jakob's disease which is CJD, if you look it up. Um, so we haven't linked a case of Kromhelps Jakob disease to Scrapey. Um, the fun thing about the prion, oh, let me step back. So um, prion protein is a highly conserved gene across most mammal species. Uh, in what, it, what the prion protein does for us, is a lot of things, and we're not exactly sure all the things it does. We believe it moves copper around the body. We believe it has stuff to do with sleep regulation and um, you know dealing with hormones and all kinds of there's like three or four other things that I can't think of off the top of my head. I, I have a whole other hour of presentation we could do chronic on. Um, that is a very black pilling conversation if we would choose to have that. Um, that is a, you know, we, we could talk about it later. But, mm -hmm. um, but basically what happens is when you're, when, you know, it misfolds, you slowly get this cascading effect of like, it just doesn't work and then it aggregates. And then it, it tells your like a couple of misfolded prion protein misfold the rest of your prion protein and your brain falls apart you get holes mm. in your brain so it's called the transmissible spongiform encephalopathy is what these diseases what is a you know, goddamn fuck don't yeah. worry i got you i got you so <laughs> a transmissible means you can transmit it spongiform means your it becomes a sponge and encephalopathy is a brain thing so your brain becomes a sponge mm. that's medical talk for it um 
So a delicious CWD, piece of Swiss cheese. Yeah, but basically, yeah. So CWD is a transmissible, is a TSE, is a, a transmissible spongiform encephalopathy for cervids. Other famous ones are Kuru, uh, famously shown in the Book of Eli, and uh, mad cow disease or uh, bovine spongiform encephalopathy. Once again, mm. encephalop- spongiform encephalopathy means brain becomes sponge. Famously, as, brains as, should not be sponges. As no. Alice is terrified of. Yes. Yeah, well, I'm terrified <laughs> of all of these, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, but the thing is that uh, the, the bovine, B- BSE, uh, which leads to variant CJD, is um, something that came up because for a long time in uh, like factory farming of beef in the United Kingdom, we would feed cows the like brain matter of other cows, which is like a bad thing to do, right? Uh, yeah. But it saved it saved some money, um, and we had a few cases of people's brains falling apart, um, and the government sort of like went heavily in on like everything is fine, and this was the nineties. This was thirty years ago. So far, single digits, low single digits. Oh, no, no, getting away no, with it. triple, triple, 200. Really? Jesus. 200. Okay. Oh, well, okay. Yeah. Alice, you're yeah. screwed. Disregard that. I'm, <laughs> yeah. But like the other thing is that that long latency that I mentioned is it is impossible to predict and could be 50 years, could be 60 years. And so, like, a lot of the, as I understand it, the health surveillance in the UK is just like, uh, there, there, there may just be this thing just waiting to like go off and like a bunch of people's brains just turn to sponges. Um, yeah, that's probably that's probably how the trans panic got started. Is always <laughs> preparing in people's heads. <laughs> well, I mean, this is the other thing, and this is the other thing that's like very, very troubling. If you have a sort of a health focused anxiety disorder, is uh, disorders of the brain, uh, sort of very nebulous, very multifarious symptoms, uh, particularly with encephalopathies. It, it, like you, you look up this stuff and like. The, the, like impossible to diagnose in a living person. You can diagnose it post mortem. Um, symptomatic diagnosis is somewhere on a spectrum between emotional changes, whatever that means, and uh, death. Right, <laughs> and like that, that's you know you, you kind of like very very difficult to uh, you know respond to that. There's no like treatment for any of this aside from palliative care. And even that's, you know, not not saying much when someone's brain is turning to sponge. And oh uh, yeah, it's all, game over. Yeah, yeah and, and all of this is like, like some kind of like filler mm. in there, you know. Um fill in the holes, but patch it up with some bondo, you know. <laughs> Perhaps make it more rigid. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um and, and the other thing about this is the the transmissibility part, which is that prions have a way of uh just surviving on stuff like surgical instruments. Um I'm gonna I'm gonna fight so- you for one second. They don't survive because yeah, they're not alive. They just mm. exist. Exist. It's, it's yeah. Very difficult to get rid of. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and this is another thing where like now we would tend to dispose of surgical instruments and we would like autoclave things and we would just not reuse things. That was not the case for a long time. And so one of the potential things to worry about is not just, you know, you ate a burger in Britain in 1997 or whatever, but that like you had surgery in Britain at any point until we started doing that. And like, you know, just like a long chain of causation goes all the way back to like cow eating cow brain. Um, All of this is fucking terrifying. So just to drive a little, just a little, like, yeah. little, little, like, button on top, just a little, like, little mm. something extra here. There's a famous case in uh, prion circles, which are not circles you really want to hang out in. They're kind no. of not fun places all the time. Um, so there was a person who had surgery. They had brain surgery because, you know, they had a prion disease and the doctors weren't super sure what it was. So they had brain surgery. Uh, the person died of, you know, the uh, CJD. The equipment went into storage, you know, it was clean, went into storage for a couple of years. Someone else had to have brain surgery at that hospital. They got the brain surgery equipment back out. And the person who they did surgery on got, you know, prion, a prion disease from the equipment, even though it had been mm-hmm. cleaned, put into storage for several years, cleaned again, then used. Yeah, yeah. it's real not fun. Um, the other so, really so, so, not fun part of CJD, or sorry, uh, chronic wasting disease is it persists, unlike, you know, BSE, it persists in the soil. So, mm. you know, a, 
a deer can get chronic wasting disease not from just interacting with other deer, but from eating plants that have taken up the uh, prion protein. Yeah, this is the fun part. What if mm -hmm. the most ubiquitous wildlife in your region all had prions? This is what we're dealing with. <laughs> okay, so, so here, here's mm. the, I gotta, I have to do this. This is where we're gonna step right outside of the scientific literature for a moment, for a moment, mm. because we don't know if chronic wasting can jump the species barrier. The species barrier appears to be very high. Chronic has been around since the '60s. No one has gotten a prion disease from chronic wasting disease. We haven't seen elevated levels of prion diseases in areas with long-term chronic wasting disease, but. I, this is where my brain goes to instantly. You have a free ranging wildlife species that likes to eat corn that has a prion disease, uh, hangs out in cornfields, and that prion can be transmitted through plants. <laughs> Fill in the blank. Mm. <laughs> um, and then the other fun thing is the prion persists on basically every material for a long mm. time. Excuse me. Yeah. I mean, the good news. To, uh, <laughs> the good news is. Yeah, well, I, the, I, I just, I, I, I am desperate for your good news here, Alice. Okay, okay. I'll do my best <laughs> to put an optimistic slant on this, right? Uh, which is two things. One of them is concrete and backed by the scientific evidence. The other one is cope, right? Uh, so which one do you want first? Oh, both. Give, give it to okay. us. Give me cope. I'll, 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 give you, I'll, I'll give you the cope one first. Okay. Uh, th this is an active locus of study, right? Um, uh, and like a lot of resources go into this, perhaps not as much as should. Uh, but when you consider that, you know, we we did manage to shake off a potentially civilization-ending pandemic with a lot of people dying, but we, you know, did stop it dead in its tracks on no notice. You can kind of go, hey, you know, maybe the uh, fucking, you know, if we're putting all our hopes in carbon capture on the basis that like someone will come up with something, it's not unreasonable to like confront something as terrifying and be like, someone will come up with something because maybe someone will. You don't know. Um, yeah. Maybe someone will make the brain more rigid. Um, <laughs> that's the copium right. one. The the sort of like the sane one. The uh, the other one is. If you take the sort of like most frightening option, which is the people who get like CJD or VCJD, um, like now or the past 20 years are sort of the early adopters, right? And they're just the like, you know, crest of a wave that is coming. If you still get, you know, 40, 50, 60 years out of it, um, th there's worse deals. It's, it's a horrible way to die, but like 50 or 60 years of like, otherwise dormant quality of life is like you know yeah you know that's fair get the a, other you get so the prion, good. thank you if you get the prion you have 50 or 60 years in which to buy an ar and kill every deer you see <laughs> yeah well yeah. So this welcome is how to we, hell bambi this is how i usually wrap up my c cwd talks is it hasn't made the jump it has made the jump in lab animals but we have cured cancer a number of times in mice and in monkeys, and we still get cancer. So because you can do something in a lab does not mean you can do it in real life, you know? So we got that going for us. The species barrier is high, and we got that going for us. Um, now, because this keeps me up at night, I will be going to, there's a national CW, international CW conference, so I'll be going to that because this just keeps me up at night. But mm. um, don't find me there. Do not look for me, by the way. <laughs> No, okay. I, mean, the, I guess yeah. I guess the other thing is is to say that like you have to rest like at the end of the day, uh, and I'm I'm deploying all of my weapons of of talking therapy here that I've learned against this because the facts as we've established them are fucking terrifying. But sometimes part of being a person is you learn some terrifying facts and then you still have to get up the next morning, right? Uh, and we don't want you to kill yourself because you listen to this podcast. So no, we want you to kill deer. Yes, exactly. Yes. You, you have to like, a, clear on that, a, find purpose in other things like killing deer, but B also uh, at some point you just have to take shit as it comes. Like that. That's just a sort of like that's a serious coping skill we all need to have as shit gets worse. Is just the ability to gaslight yourself and go, okay, whatever. I still have work in the morning. 
Or the other really fun thing that you can do. I'm not a creative oh, writer. Joe, what's up? But if you, oh. <laughs> if you want to do some really fun creative writing is you could like, you know, write a dystopian future where people have gotten it's jump the species bear. And that would be a very interesting, you know, and novel science, sci, sci-fi thing. Mm. Okay, well, um, that's been fun. Let's let's uh, talk about some other fun stuff. Fuck it, yeah. Fucking, Next fucking, slide. like your 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 poor prions. That all of their heat has been stolen by uh, the fungus guys, who also have plenty of reasons to terrify you, but have just like monopolized <laughs> the discourse on this one. You know? Yeah. I mean, Last of Us. Come on, Zombie Land came out earlier. I mean, sure, that was BSC, not really an accurate representation of how prions rep, you know, manifest in humans. But Zombie Land did it already. Mm. Yeah. Okay, next slide, please. Yes. Hi, it's Justin. Uh, so this is a commercial for the podcast that you're already listening to. Uh, people are annoyed by these, so let me get to the point. We have this thing called Patreon, right? The deal is you give us two bucks a month, and we give you an extra episode once a month. Uh, sometimes it's a little inconsistent, but, you know, it's two bucks, you get what you pay for. Um, it also gets you our full back catalog of bonus episodes, so you can learn about exciting topics like guns, pickup trucks, or pickup trucks with guns on them. The money we raise through Patreon goes to making sure that the only ad you hear on this podcast is this one. Anyway, that's something to consider if you have two bucks to spare each month. Uh, join at patreon.com forward slash WTYP pod. Do it if you want. Or don't. It's your decision, and we respect that. Back to the show. Uh, it's the official Well, There's Your Problem podcast a stance that you should kill every deer you see. <laughs> yes, that's right. That's right. <laughs> as a precaution yes. or as, you know, uh, revenge, depending yeah. on how you feel about it. Yeah, revenge. Let's be clear. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Whatever whatever floats your boat, whatever kills your deer, I'm fine with. As long as it's legal and ethical, I'm cool with it. Happy for you. Encourage mm -hmm. you. Love to see you out there. I'll take you out myself and teach you how to kill them. Okay, so... <laughs> This plant that we are seeing is not native to the United States. However, this picture is taken in Pennsylvania. This is Japanese mm. stiltgrass. Mm. This is what we call an invasive species. So there are lots of non-native plants that you can find in America. You can find all kinds of like eggplants and broccoli and all that kind of stuff. Those are non-native plants. An invasive species is a non-native plant that can replicate itself outside of captivity for 10 plus years can expand and it does damage either socially, economically, or ecologically. Like kudzu, Pennsylvania has right? a lot of invasive species. All right, sorry, what was that? Oh, I was like, like, like kudzu. That's the classic one, right? Oh yeah, mm, kudzu. Yeah. Kudzu is a classic. I would, what's I would the, like. What's the East German like communist invasive species? Is it milkweed or hogweed? Um, uh, we've given you guys. Um, Hogweed, you gave to us. We gave you uh, milkweed. We also gave you guys black locust. It was imported intentionally, um, and then you didn't. The Germans didn't quite figure out that it was going to go, um, mm. and it went. Yeah, it's a problem. Yeah. It's a problem Hog there. Hogweed's the one that kills you if you touch it, right? I don't think it kills you. It's just I think it's an you're out. It's um, you know, a big like itching thing. Mm. Uh, that's more of a farm thing. I don't deal with farms. They, they, they've I'm tried to guy. eradicate it from the United States, but there's like three plants outside of the Israeli embassy that they have not been able to kill yet. Um, so the thing with invasive species, I, I have this layer in the slides, so we'll talk about it now, um, is that we like to bring them in. We do this to ourselves most of the time. <laughs> this is not that's like what really hurts. Yeah. Yeah, so, so we yeah. do this to ourselves, and then we don't pay attention to these non-native plants until they become a problem. So like with, you know, this is an insect, but with spy lanternfly, we knew about it when it showed up in the port of Philadelphia. We knew about it when it got to Pittsburgh, and we just didn't do anything. And when I say we didn't do anything, I'm looking at the railroads didn't do anything. They just didn't take biosecurity seriously because they're like, we are, you know, a tier one railroad. We do what we want. Yeah. <laughs> 
So meanwhile, there's I was very stomping study. them as fast as I could. <laughs> yeah. There's a very fun hey, study but, about like, the relation of uh, spotted lanternfly invasions and findings in railroads. It's like 90 plus percent. But I will say one thing in the defense of Class 1 railroads. They kill a shitload of deer. <laughs> Yeah, they have the oh, whole yeah. thing you, on the front. You, yeah, you, you could, you can, you regularly see one of those big locomotives with like a pink mist on the front of it from <laughs> <laughs> several kill deer it killed. They'll kill a moose. They'll, they'll kill a moose. I've heard tell of they'll moose, kill a car yeah, and moose and in the rut. <laughs> Sorry, what was that? I said they'll kill a car and its occupants. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. they'll, they'll even try for Ohio. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I. I'm not going to say critical support for trying to kill Ohio, but like Aww. not a huge Ohio fan. Not a huge Ohio fan, but not critical support. Ohio is don't, don't hurt Ohio anymore. Yep. It's already Ohio. So we have 140 non-native invasive species, terrestrial plants in Pennsylvania. We got a lot of them. We are at a really fun intersection of three major ecosystem types. We have the Appalachians. We got some of the Southwest and the coastal plain around you guys in Philly. And then we have the Northern forests and the Northern region up by kind of Erie Kane area. So that's where we get all the non-natives. We also have a couple of really fun things. So invasive species are directly linked to international commerce and shipping. So we have the Port of Philly. uh, You know, we got Baltimore right there. And then we also have New York is pretty close. So we get all of the invasives. We get them all. Fun thing for us. Um, Sorry, I'm still thinking about prions. No, it's okay. okay. Don't worry. I, I try not to think about them too much. All right. So, so invasive species ride, are a problem. Baby. <laughs> they they prevent native plant growth. They also hurt wildlife. Nothing can eat this. Goats don't even eat stilt grass. They don't like it. It's too. It's got too much silica. Bog turtles cannot climb through this. It is too thick for them because they're just little guys. If you're at home, just Google bog turtle. Maybe Devin will be nice and drop in a picture of a bog turtle. They're cute bog little turtle. guys. Aww. Yeah, they're just cute little guys. Hmm. They're just little buds. He doesn't know what a prion is. No, no. And he's not going to get infected by a prion because he's a reptile. Yeah. So, so like, we're, we're, we're all fucked, but it, like, he's good, you know? Yeah, oh, yeah, I've yeah, seen one a, of these guys before. Thing. Yeah, they're cool. They're neat. Oh, yeah. He's yeah, a cute little they're, guy. They're just yeah. cute little guys. But they can't yeah. move this. It's too thick for them, especially when they're little guys. Like, when mm-hmm. they're just hatchlings, can't move through it, they die. Ah. Um, oh. All right, so yeah. two things: kill every deer you see, and like get a scythe, Your and, scythe. Um, yeah, yeah, sort yeah. of a just like a flamethrower, you know. Oh, well, yeah. remember we were talking scythe about Agent up, Orange? Yeah, mm. I, that was you know, not a fan of chemical companies. You know, Bear took part in the Holocaust. Dow did Agent Orange. Uh, mostly, we try to control these through chemical means because that's really the only thing that works on a lot of these. So you got to get out there and spray them with chemicals. If biocontrols work, they wouldn't be so invasive. Purple loose stripe has a biocontrol that works. Not weed does not have any biocontrol that works. Oh, uh, Stillcrest does not have any. You really got to get out there and spray these things. Kind of the only thing that really works. Hmm. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so that's fun. Um, got to hit them with the old roundup. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We usually we use so in forestry we use glyphosate and triclopyr for the most part. Um, here you would use sulfametron. Uh, which is not Roundup. It, Roundup is a glyphosate. And those are actually really tame chemicals when it comes to pesticides. Um, not a chemist forester, so like, if you want to get into chemical discourse, you guys go off. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. I'm still thinking about I don't about, know enough I, this, about this it. I'm still like, thinking about prions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, afraid so, afraid so. You gotta uh, leave that behind, Alice. We're, we're past I'm doing, prions. I, I'm, I'm doing We've my best here. we moved past the prions. Leave them mm. behind. We're gonna Catch find something worse. Is there something like a conservative plants. Parsi minister in like 1992? I am about to tell you with the death of a couple more billion individuals. Catch up. Come on now. Okay. 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 Mass deaths. <laughs> Mass deaths. Yeah. 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 Deaths. Well, I guess this is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I guess it's hundreds of thousands for sure. Potentially billions. Okay. Moving on. We're talking about the loss of species, uh, genuses in a second. So. Uh, the other really fun thing about invasive species are because deer eat most of the forest. There's a lot of open niches. And so the invasives come up because you got nothing left out there except for what deer don't eat. Um, there's some really interesting research about how uh, non-native honeysuckles are changing the colors of cedar waxwings. And they're becoming not sexy to female cedar waxwings, the males. 
and so reproduction is going down because they can't eat or because the, I bet the, you have the females don't find them sexy. Pronouns. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. These are also uh, useless to native insects. Mm -hmm. Oh, I podcasted already for an hour this morning. Come on, catch up, guys. <laughs> All right, next slide. I'm doing good. This, this has the energy of being like I'm, I feel like I'm being led through the forest on a, like a guided hike. You know? Yeah. Uh, oh, I would do that. I, I, I'm struggling for breath, baby. Come on, yeah. I, see, I yeah. do like yeah. 50 of those a, a year. This is nothing. We're, yeah, we're getting started. I'm seeing a lot I'm, of fuzzy caterpillars here. I'm a Ooh. real fun guy outside of my work. My work is not fun. <laughs> okay, so Liam. You guys might know, Liam and Justin, you guys might know what this is. What is this? This is a lot of fuzzy caterpillars. Yeah, so this is Spongy Moth. Uh, it oh, had yeah. a Ugh. previous name, which we're not going to mention on this podcast. Oh, was it racist? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. Okay. Can yeah. you, can you yeah. tell yeah. me, it, like, satisfy my curiosity, and we have dev belief, but what what was the... Spongy Moth. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, I've heard sure. of that, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah for yeah. sure. Is that, I was renamed uh, to Spongy Roma, Moth. Roma people moth. Well, so <laughs> it was renamed to Spongy Moth to be in line with what the French call it. So there's one French asshole that we have to blame for this, actually. This guy, uh, 18 Trouvalu. Um, I'm probably saying the last name wrong, but, you know, whatever. Fuck him. He imported this species. Mm. All right. So um, yeah, but he was he less racist this... about naming it than us. <laughs> <sighs> uh, he's French and they're, you know, Roma people. So let's not. Yeah, you know, mm. too much credit. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Let's not get into that. So, so they he brought this he brought spongy moth to the U.S. because he wanted to hybridize it with some native moths that we have and create a silk industry. Um, in the 1700s, mm. this will surprise you, but European moths and American moths, not related, didn't work. Ah. So he gave up on the experiment. He just let them go, and then wow. he went off to become like pretty important in early astronomy. Huh. Who yeah, would just okay. really be like a renaissance man at that point? Literally. Well, not literally. Oh, yeah, Like sure. 200 years later, but like... It's gonna go import something else next, like elephants or lions or something. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, so Homie walks away from these, they escape. Um, if you look up uh, Spongy Moth, there's some really interesting pictures of like, guys way out on the tips of these branches trying to pick these caterpillars off. Excuse me again. Surprisingly, um trying to pick off and squish individual caterpillars when they have a population of this size does not work. Um, there's really no control for these. These will defoliate entire mountainsides. We saw some bad defoliations this year. I'm expecting to see some more next year. Um, and again, this will surprise you. Trees don't like it when they lose all their leaves. Mm. Yeah, tend, to, tend to die. Can we, can we to, not import like to... another deadlier invasive species to eat them? Oh yeah, like the Simpsons, uh, the Simpsons bit, the mongoose. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so there's a native virus, and we're we're gonna get to how this all falls apart in a second. So, you there's a couple. You might be able to see it in the video. You can definitely see it in the presentation. There's a couple of caterpillars that are kind of flipped over. So the ones that have, are flipped over in like a reverse V, um, those have this virus that makes their intestines explode and spread the virus. It's a native virus. And then the ones that um, are just dead and kind of have like a regular dead to the tree, those have gotten uh, BT, which is a native, uh, I can't remember if it's a bacteria or a fungus. All right, don't, don't, don't quote me on this one. Two so potential apocalypses right there. Yeah, so, so, so it kills them and we can spray um, insecticides. We spray BT, which again, native fungus. We spray Mimic, which is an insecticide. The problem is to control spongy mouth populations, you have to get 99% kill. Which is difficult to do. That seems ambitious. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. it doesn't really, you know, you, you can knock down populations, you can't eliminate it. Uh, it just keeps spreading. And the other thing is, these guys fly. Not just like when they're moss, but this caterpillar, it'll throw strings out and it'll fly down the mountain. I used to see these guys all the time back uh, when I was a kid and riding on the Washington Old Dominion Trail. Yeah, they have kind of a boom and bust cycle. Some people will tell you they're naturalized. I don't think they are. They're just incredibly damaging. But this is just yeah. one of the invasive insects we have. So next we get into, here's where I promise you millions and hundreds of millions of death. Here, here oh, it is, oh, yeah. the old ash borer. Let's, go, let's get some mega deaths, yeah. Oh, wait, mm. no, 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 don't go forward. Go back, go back. Oh, We're sticking with wait. the invasive insects. Okay. Yeah, we, climate change hasn't really hit us too hard yet. So we have uh, emerald ash borer uh, driving ash to extinction across the state. 
We have pumpkin ash, green ash, and black ash. 99% fatal in green ash, uh, 98% fatal in pumpkin ash, and 88% fatal in black ash. So that whole genus is headed right towards functional extinction. And then if you look across the U.S., we're probably going to lose like 2 billion ash. So Jesus fuck. I yeah, hear about the genus out the window. I hear about diseases like this and I'm kind of like, why hasn't this, why haven't we had a disease like this kill all of the humans? You know? <laughs> well, COVID sure tried, bud. I yeah. tried, but it wasn't I, very again, good. I, I, I'm, I'm back to the cope <laughs> thing. Medicine. Like we, we invented like uh, systems of like uh, diagnosis and treatment and quarantine I mean, and shit like that. The, the only upside to EAB is it's 99%. 99.99% fatal. So you can find that 0.001 tree that's not killed. Um, they're having some success regenerating s- some ash in parts of Michigan where it's been for a very long time. And they've managed to establish some parasitoids. Um, is that possible for everywhere? I don't know. I don't know. Hmm. Okay. So that was that was EAB. Next we have... I'm sorry, that just that's just it. There's no... There's no out. The next is hem, uh, hemlock woolly adelgid. So hemlock is our old growth forest condition. Important to keep streams cold. Um, hemlock woolly adelgid kill hemlocks of five to seven years. Uh, moving its way rapidly across the state. This is not the first time I've said it. it. Won't be the last. I don't think. I think if things don't change soon, we're looking at the functional extinction of hemlock within twenty years. So functional oh, extinction means twenty years time we'll have some we'll have some bigger problems maybe and we'll know if we have prion disease yeah, no, yeah. yeah maybe so so uh, functional extinction is different from like total extinction so there will still be some on the landscape but not enough to com- do their ecological role so hemlock write that one off put that one in the bin um, oak wilt is picking up oak wilt a non native <laughs> fungus excuse me we also have beech bark disease and beech leaf disease beech bark disease is uh, an, in, an insect and two non-native fungus that kill mature beech. Beech leaf disease is a really new one. It's a nematode and potentially something else that kills small beech. So we're just squeezing beech right out of the forest. <laughs> beech I have a question. Headed right for death, yeah. So my question is, has, say that we made this like priority number one, uh, like, Everyone in the field had all of the resources they could imagine, like Apollo program investment in like reversing this. Would there be like what, what could be done? Could anything be done? Is this just like locked in? Uh, like, yeah. So, so for some of these, we're done. Like, it's gone. It's escaped. Mm. Like EAB, there's no that the genie's out of the bottle there. Um, Hemlock woolly adelgid, there's no putting that one back. So like Asian longhorn beetle, it's a related, you know, it's it's a non-native beetle, boring beetle, kind of related to um, emerald ash borer, and it attacks more species. We've put a lot of money into containing that pest, and we've done pretty well so far. Hmm. It has, you know, it's gotten out a couple of times, but we found it and we're killing a lot of it where it is, where it's gotten out. So, you know, if you get on it fast, there's potential to stop these kind of things. Um, the, the real answer is just don't bring it in. Like mm. just take biosecurity very sure. seriously and just don't bring it in, and you stop the problems. Make everywhere Australia. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no. Uh, unironically, yes. Well, you know, on that front, you know, Australia's yeah. got its own things <laughs> in in a, in a couple of ways. Uh... Yeah. Um. So so going back to species we've lost, we already lost butternut. Talked about chestnut. Uh, American elm has been hammered with Dutch elm disease. And then oh, yeah. here's another fun disease that you might not be super familiar with. It's elm yellows, which is a phioplasma, a kind of bacteria that has like no cell wall or membrane. This is also fucking weird. But I'm I'm looking at the forest and just like screaming, just be normal. <laughs> just, I thought ever. this was fucking trees and shit and it turns out that there's like uh, like biologically interesting Bio stuff weapons. happening. Yeah, yeah there's a, a whole way. ecosystem behind you're, yeah. you're now seeing the forest for the trees. Yeah, I don't That's like it. Bad. I want to go back. <laughs> The method of transmission for like Dutch elm disease has always confused me because we used to have like five big elms in the woodland cemetery right near where I live. And they um 
you know, they all got Dutch elm disease at the same time and there was no elms anywhere nearby them and they had to cut them all down. And it was like, where did this come from? <laughs> um, oh, Dutch elm. I think that that one is either associated with a boar or just kind of floats on its. Oh, yeah, it's, I'm just looking it up. It's associated with a, a native borer beetle. So, so we have just native insects. They're just flying around, just, you know, getting after in, injured, wounded trees. And so oh, they'll pick God. up the fungus, <laughs> fly over and jump on the next tree and infect it. Same thing with oak wilt. Mm. Damn. Um, yeah. I'm, still, I'm still thinking too. about prions. I bet. Yeah. <laughs> you could I have a like the, thing has, the thing is, the thing is, right, the, the, the prion conference, when you go to that, that's, that's going to be, I, I think there's an important sort of thing you can graph here for conferences, which is importance to like risk of like civilization ending versus uh like consumption at bar afterwards right so like if the, the you know the astrophysicists who are like worrying about um like you know asteroids slamming into earth aren't drinking a lot it's all good not going to worry about the asteroids right if the encephalopathy guys are hitting the bar pretty hard that's where i'm going to sort of like focus my anxiety you know well, the deer guys do drink pretty well, and they party pretty hard, so it's a good time mm -hmm. if you go to a deer conference. Can't, mm. I can't recommend it enough if you get a chance to go to one. It's a great time. By <laughs> Allah, I have seen prions caused solely by pictures viewed on the internet. God. <laughs> this, is, this is exactly the kind of like unconscious thought OCD would give me, so no thank you. Uh, all right, all right, I'm off of prions. Uh, yeah, okay, next, so, next. so basically the point, oh, then we also have laurel wilt disease, which is on the horizon. Luckily, it's not going to kill overstory trees. It kills all members of, of the family Lauraceae for you plant nerds out there. Um, so th in Pennsylvania, that's spice bush and sassafras. Um, for avocado heads, uh, it does kill avocados. Uh, and it is moving oh. towards avocados in the U.S. Hey, but once it kills every avocado in the U.S., millennials will finally be able to buy a house. Good <sighs> I fucking Good wish. So what <laughs> trees will we have left? That is a great question. <laughs> Uh, it, fuck. <laughs> tulip poplar looks good. Uh -huh. Um, that's a that's a species so old it's outlived most of its pests. Um, eastern white pine looks okay. Some of the poplars look all right. I uh, yeah. We have like a hundred tree species, and I just named three. Okay, like this is a this is why we're having the episode here. Hey, but it's we not like commercially you know, the, farmed the trees. spruce pine fir, and that's it. Oh, we can't grow yeah. spruce pine in Pennsylvania. That doesn't work here. Oh, uh, well. No, the good no, news we don't is do that, that. Like, th those trees aren't important to like uh, anything to do with the climate or anything. We don't need them. Yeah. Oh, we're going to get to that in one second. The nice thing is um, white oak is not impacted by oak wilt, and it's not impacted by any of the, besides spongy moth, any of the insects that we've listed so far, and that is key to making bourbon. Key. You literally can't make bourbon without white oak. Oh, the problem God. with white oak is I deer fucking love it. But they do. Oh, uh, yeah. I so if you just kill bourbon, the deer. So. Kill all of the deer. We really can't emphasize this one enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. I'm, I'm not I doing will... it to preserve bourbon supply because I hate bourbon, but like. What? It's, what? Oh, that's that's insane. No, no, no. The, ta the taste of bourbon has this kind of like sour corn mash taste that I really don't like. I would yeah, rather just good. drink whiskey. I mean, no, good, it, yeah. I, no, it has like a really, for some reason, it's like maybe I'm like one of these people for whom coriander tastes like soap or something, but the aftertaste, of, like bourbon has a serious, serious aftertaste for me. Like I drink bourbon, it's all I can like taste for the next day. Um, and I, it's yeah, that's the only it's like. Good. Have, ah, have you this... tried the drink of the people, which is. A, a you know a Kentucky Mule bourbon with a little ginger beer in there, a little bit of lime. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah, with, doesn't one. matter with mixing it. Doesn't matter mm. what bourbon it is. You're like a Manhattan, uh, you like, can do like a, a mint julep. That's always a nice rye. One. Rye whiskey doesn't do that to me. Uh, you know, like any kind. Of, it's the only spirit that does that to me. But like, not only does it give me like the the horrible aftertaste, but like I drink bourbon, and no matter how much or how little I drink, I have like a two day hangover, uh, and I have. I have no idea why. So Bourbon and I uh, do not well, get along. Because you're a giant little uh, poop pants cry baby. Well, here's yeah, that, the other that, fun that thing. Too, but... The, well, the reason so that you need to care about white oak... I'm not allowed to say that anymore, but I do. No, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> the reason you need to care about white oak, you know, is because it makes all of your other brown liquors. Um, oh, okay. Brown liquors are now brown because they age in oak 
barrels except for scotch, which also has peat in it. But who wants to drink, you know, dead plants when you could have me? wood? Me? I want to. I want to drink the the, the yeah, peaty scotch. Uh, yeah. No. Come on. Uh, Irish whiskey aged in white oak barrels because it's a very good and tasty oak. You know, you you have yeah, three. Scotch is better. We're gonna. This is now liquor mm. talk. Second. Yeah, um, liquor I like talk. I like my Talisker. Yeah. I like to t- you know I like to taste yeah, the shit that like Ertzi the Before like I, fucking yeah, caveman taste, died in. It's like a burning yeah. down hospital. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I want I want I, mean, I want to drink like Tolland man. You know, sometimes a nice smoky scotch is fine, but um, so white oak is it's got tyloses in it, which are these little bubbles in the fibers um, that prevent liquid from moving through it. So if you want to age liquid for a long time, white oak is very good, which is why you legally have to use white oak to make bourbon. You can only use the barrel once. And then after you use that barrel, they sell it to like all of the other liquor distillers and agers out there because it's a very good barrel and it's tasty. So like. I was in Scotland this summer. I was in a distillery and I saw white oak. I like went up to the wood and I was like, hey, I know that. I grow that here in Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so we lose white oak. The the quality of spirits and wine across the world is going to suffer. You have to what go about, back to vodka. We have a good uh, uh, gin Wait, here right. in Philadelphia by Philadelphia Distilling that's aged in uh, they make whiskey white too oak now. Uh, bourbon barrels. Um, yep, you yep. Know, you get that kind of that nice flavor uh, in there. Blue coat, if you're looking for it. Blue coat gin, yeah, it's very good. Um, I think the bourbon guys say like 70% of the flavor from in bourbon comes from white oak. So, Alice, what you might not like is the flavor of white oak. Are you anti-tree? Oh. <laughs> yeah. I think I may be anti tree. I think oh, I may have to adopt like a deer Alice persona. Bambi Caldwell Kelly. Mm, yeah. That's right. She's Miss actually Prairie she's over not here. just as she anti tree, she's pro deer. Yeah. That's pro true. peatlands. Boo. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, without without peatlands, where is you know, where are you gonna get poets writing about peat cussing? Uh, and that's like a good five percent of the Irish economy for like until they got into real estate. Well, and now they're putting trees in the peatlands because that's where farmers don't want to farm. And so they're putting trees on it. Um, mm. In college, I had a job with uh, this Forest Service initiative where we, I was dissecting uh, frozen blocks of peat from around the world. And we were weighing what was peat and what was planted in there. Uh, looking back on it, I definitely should have had some kind of mask on because, like, who knows what is thawing out of those peat blocks? Oh, oh man. Oh, God. Just like dudes, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. 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 Okay, so next slide. Let's let's get on to our favorite thing. A new thing. and exotic Brian. Yeah. Uh, yes. This, so this is climate change here. We're going to talk about climate change. Um, I'm sure everyone knows about the climate crisis. Uh, climate changing, bad I'm human cause. I'm not scared of it anymore because I'm mostly worried about the prions. Yeah, well, hey, you know, to each their own. Um, mm-hmm. I'm, not a, I'm not a climate change fan. What we're expecting in Pennsylvania is our winters are going to get warmer. We got like no snow this year that stayed where I'm at. We're going to get hotter summers. We're going to get more 90 degree summers. This climate is better for invasive species because our plants are not adapted to it. It's more stressful than the native plants. We're going to see how native plants and invasive species interact in one second. Um, just for, I, I'm not a physical scientist. Again, I'm a tree guy, but just for one, like, just look into how this impacts the physical science. Uh, hot air holds moisture longer. So we have more moist air, but less moisture in the soil hence the cracked soil photo. But because it's hot, trees are, um, they're, they're photosynthesizing more, they have increased transpiration, so they're sucking more water out of the ground, which means they struggle more in droughts. Also means that aquifers get filled slower. Just one, one impact. Um, less snow is not good for most of our tree species. They're used to having a blanket of snow on them in the winter. Snow is a really good moderating factor for the climate. It also protects you from seed predators and sapling predators. Um, it's really also, fun if you. Sorry, it keeps kids out of school. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what the dang Zoom kids be on the phone these days. You know, oh my oh, god, that's ridiculous. the worst thing that I think has ever happened to kids is they don't have snow days anymore. Yeah, it's it's, it's, it's inhumane. Yes. Yeah. yeah, honestly, I'm not. I'm not really fucking with you. No, I I agree. Yeah, a snow day is a snow day. You shouldn't have to go back to school. You shouldn't yeah. have to do online school. Bad for teachers too. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. Okay, so let's see how invasive species and tree stress and climate all interact. Next slide, please. So, oh, oh I have fun animations in this one. So in forestry, we'd like to do these triangles. So uh, give me an animation. 
I don't think we can do that, Kevin. Is it going to work? Probably not. It almost uh, never does. Come on. Oh, yeah. 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 Take that. Um, okay. So this is hemlock, uh, eastern hemlock or Canada hemlock, uh, Tasuga canadensis, if you want the you know botanical name. So hemlock likes a cool, dry climate. We are, as I said before, going to a hot, moist climate. All right. So, well, it likes, it likes moist soil, doesn't like it you know, when it's not moist and cool. Okay, so the hemlock is getting stress from climate change. Next, give me a click. Yeah. Okay, now this is uh, in this picture. Again, I'm not sure how it's gonna show up in the video. Hopefully it shows it perfectly. Uh, you can see little cotton balls on the branch. Those are hemlock woolly adelgid, non-native invasive insect, kills hemlocks in five years. Uh, these were kept in check. It was first introduced in the 60s. 60s, it was kept pretty well in check by cold winters. So you get a negative four, a couple of negative four days that kills like 80% of the population. A negative 30 day kills 90 plus percent of the population to 100%. So cold days that, keep those that, in check. Uh, for, our, uh, for, for our European uh, uh, folks, it, oh, that, I have no that's idea. Fahrenheit, right? Mm -hmm. um, you oh, double yeah. it and add 30. Well, we're below zero. Like yeah. we're below zero mm. Fahrenheit, so I think this is kind of when they merge together. Yeah, that's like well, yeah, they they merge together at negative forty, I believe is the the point. I so. um, but, yeah, negative thirty one's pretty close to negative forty. Yeah, but like uh, negative four Fahrenheit is like negative a million degrees Celsius. I'm gonna punch you in the face. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think in, they in have defense, those temperatures. <laughs> in in the defense of Fahrenheit, it was like written down and like codified as a measurement system before Celsius. Well, it's yeah. so it's objectively better. A better, but yes, no, yeah, it's not. It's that's no, not. It the is case. no. no it's, you, I'm, you, sorry, you, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Are you still speaking English over there? Are you? I, oh, that's crazy. I like it. Yeah. I like it when water at sea level boils at a hundred degrees and freezes at zero. Um, yeah, no, to me, that's good. To the best temperature measurement, which is Rankine. Oh no! <laughs> I've never even heard of that. Rankine, Rankine? is uh, so you know how there's the 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 Kelvin, Kelvin scale, right, which starts at yeah. absolute zero. Rankine yeah. is the same thing, but with Fahrenheit degrees. <laughs> oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah, take that. Yeah, fuck <laughs> you. <laughs> we'll show you. We'll make our own measurement scale. <laughs> okay. Now we have one more. It's, this is a triangle, so we're going to see the triangle. Yes. Rankin, uh, one more fun fact. Uh, was Died in Glasgow. He was very Scottish. Oh, yeah. Well, Rankin and, and Calvin both, uh, like, University of Glasgow guys, I believe. Uh, those guys, I oh, bet they, like, me. fought each other, you know? Mm -hmm. Lord Kelvin, a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so here is your other part of the triangle is that the uh, hemlock really does just doing much, much better under climate change. And we're now seeing massive hemlock mortality, which contributes to climate change because our big hemlock hemlocks, which are a great storage unit of, you know, of carbon. Big trees store store carbon for a long time. Mm -hmm. Really get a pulling out of the atmosphere. Atmosphere dead. Mm. Well, yeah, well then. that's it. To yep. the to the tune of like oh. millions, right? Like yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Feedback yeah. loops, okay. they're fun. Yeah, hmm. yeah, yeah. Don't not even once. Okay, so let's put this all together and let's see how it interacts in an eastern forest. Next slide. So this is a bunch of plants. This looks like a, you know, something maybe a forest. I don't know. Actually, I do know. Spoiler alert, I took this picture. Uh, so this is <laughs> this, this is a, no longer a functioning forest. There are like two native plants in this picture. So there's the Roz, if you could just like draw a little circle or Justin, if you could draw a little circle yeah. over the um uh, that branch that's hanging out. Oh, this guy. Over yeah, there there's yeah. one native plant, and then there's kind of a little canopy left in the black cherry that's just touching that branch. Is that up here? Yeah, let's see. Yeah. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Right guy? there, perfect. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah. The rest of the plants in this photo are not native invasive. Cool. Also Everything of, else here is is it is not native. A lot of dead sticks on the ground as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Getting closer um, to like a, a, a scrub, and of course, uh, we don't want no scrubs. Yeah. 
Scrub yeah, some, is the some... guy who thinks he's fine. C- because oh, a no. scrub is a biome defined by lack of trees, meaning that well, the soil's drier and there's a risk of fire. It's known in France as a maquis. I yeah. I would I would actually this is a thing. I feel that like I'm working I just got my ass kicked. <sighs> I would call no, this I, a I, zombie I got that off forest. A tweet. Okay. Ooh. Cool. So okay. This, this on the surface, it looks like it's a living forest, but when you push on it, it has no soul. There is like two trees left in this forest. Everything else is dead stems that are overrun with oriental bittersweet and mile a minute. Um, so to the uninitiated, it looks like a functioning forest. It's not. Nothing, nothing here is native. This will be the future condition of this forest until the dead trees fall down, in which case it'll just be. So we see in this photo um, some autumn olive, multiflora rose, and a couple of species of non-native barberry. Uh, That'll just take over. The dead tree standing will uh, eventually fall down. What happened here, uh, this is in western PA, right up against the Ohio border, is this is a forest that was um, ash and black cherry. The ash was killed by the aforementioned uh, emerald ash borer, and the black cherry died just due to natural mortality. It can only live to be 120 years old. So um, it died. And then what came in, you know, what, what just took off following the failure of ash was all these invasive species. Now, the dead sticks that we see are the landowner trying really hard to knock back the invasive species, but this is going to take like a decade of work to knock back the invasive species, and then you have to keep the deer out to get the natives on the ground. This is the worst case scenario. This is what could happen to eastern forests, you know, without action. So if you just want to put your hands up and let Jesus take the wheel, um, Jesus was a carpenter in like, you know, AD. This is, he's not a good driver. This is where we go. <laughs> <laughs> also like cutting down a lot of trees, you have to imagine. Um, it, it's cool hey, that I, like- I'm here for cutting down trees sustainably. Hmm. But it, it's cool that this, uh, this photo is like now apocalyptic to me, uh, oh, when yeah. going through the notes, I was like, oh, cool. Pretty. Yeah, no, no, no. This is actually not, this is very much not. Um, it reminds me yeah. of my- my 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 grandmother's uh house in Enfield, Connecticut. Um, there was this big dead tree in the back. And I one of those. Was we wanted uh I, I, I my 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 dad and my uncle were like, we gotta get rid of this big dead tree. Um because well they didn't know it was dead at the time, but what they did know is there's huge poison ivy vine surrounding it. And then I realized before they were going to cut it down, it was dead, and the only thing that was keeping up it up was the, the poison ivy vine. Um, <laughs> so a really fun way to differentiate poison ivy from oriental bittersweet um, is that oriental bittersweet will wrap very tightly around a tree and strangle it, as you can see in a lot of these trees, whereas poison ivy has these like hairy roots that come off the, the vine that attach it to the tree. And it's also a branching vine. It gets kind of ugly, doesn't branch. You know, get, it gets out there. Yeah. Okay. But um, so we have actually beaten Mother Nature. Um, yeah, there's a concept in it. forestry called succession, which is like you go from uh, you know a shade intolerant you know grasses to shade intolerant trees to shade tolerant trees to more shade tolerant trees to old growth and then back to early successional species. This will go nowhere. We beat Mother Nature. This is. This is the end of the line. This is an ecosystem that has never existed. Um, this has no value for native wildlife. If you are a native insect, you can't eat any of these plants. Um, honeysuckle sub- or invasive honeysuckle supports no native insects, whereas native oak species can support 400 plus species of, oh, excuse me, native Lepidoptera, which are moths, are moths and uh, butterflies. Honeysuckle supports none. So this is just no value. If we're, you know, if we're thinking about this from a forestry perspective, no value. We're thinking about this from a wildlife perspective, no value. If you think about this from a carbon sequestration perspective, no value, because like all of these little stems are going to rot very quickly and they cannot sequester as much carbon, cannot sequester and store as much carbon as the cherry that we see in the right foreground of this photo. So this is not what we want. This is a failure. This is bad. Okay. Next slide. I try to be a little bit positive. So here we're going to be a little bit positive. We can regenerate forests with a lot of effort. So here we see a deer fence. This keeps the deer out. 
the landowners here, they had foresters come in, they had a logger come in. They did a very you know, intentional harvest and they were able to, on the left, successfully regenerate a forest. It takes money, time, and effort to do this. It costs about $80 an acre to spray herbicides. Um, this fencing now costs $7 a linear foot Jesus. to put up because Ooh. of steel prices. It used to cost $2, but then steel prices went up. Um, and you don't see a return. Like these landowners will never see a return on this investment. Those trees are going to take at least 80 years to mature. So under the system of capitalism that we have today, this is a terrible investment. This is a bad investment. They're, they're losing money on this. Mm. Um, however, they're doing the right thing ecologically, biologically, for human health, wildlife help, health. But uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, you, you can read Gen Forest if you try and if you work hard. <laughs> But if you don't, you, you don't. And if you're I'm gonna, willing I'm gonna to put my lips directly on the microphone that... here, climate Stalin. If you're willing to wait to see results until after you are dead, um, mm -hmm. well, that's mm -hmm. just the business of forestry. Yeah, <laughs> you're you're always working for not the the person after you, but the person like two generations after you. This is a 120 year business. Every step you make is looking for looking for 120 years it's it's hard for people who don't think about trees to think in that time frame that's the time scale you're thinking but again this is where we get to have the really fun capitalism discussion under our system mm. of capitalism regenerating this forest is very 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 difficult because you have to put a lot of money in up front and you will probably never see the financial return on this oh fun sure yeah there can, are programs can, like can the conservation trust? reserve Sorry, what was that? I was like, can you trust the guy who comes after you and the guy who comes after that to continue the program? Probably that's not. A great, yeah. That's great. That's a great question. The average land tenure in Pennsylvania is eight years. So you're, you're looking, you know, 10 ownerships. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So capitalism, folks. Yeah. Capitalism was climate the real enemy all Stalin. along. Wow. Climate <laughs> Stalin. Stalin. Uh, you need, yes, you climate. need at least two or three climate Stalins in success. Yeah, yeah. You need a, you need a climate <laughs> Stalin, a climate Khrushchev. Then climate has to fall to revisionism. Uh, I was going to say climate like a, Tito. A long climate gerontocracy. Yeah, let me get a climate Tito. Actually, I like uh, that guy more. Tito. And then and then and then finally, uh, you know, degenerating into climate Gorbachev. You have climate Pizza Hut, and then that leads you straight through to climate Yeltsin. Um, <laughs> climate. No, Putin? I'm. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't even know what that is. We invade Mars or something. I, I, I feel like... <laughs> Suck that, Elon! <laughs> yeah. Mar Mars is historically Russian. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Doing a land acknowledgement on Mars. Yeah, this oh this land is traditionally unknown bacterial land. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I don't know. I, I think it's like increasingly obvious that if you want to have any kind of like sustainable future for humanity, you have to, you know act unilaterally in ways that capitalism like disincentivizes uh and i i don't know how you do that i don't know how you make any politician do that um other than uh redacted redacted parody redacted and even that may be too late um not that it matters because yeah. of the fucking like uh, the, the the prions so mm -hmm. Well, I mean, hopefully, uh, we're just hoping we're you know, yeah, we're we're putting hopefully. our faith in the species barrier. All right, Justin, next slide for me. Yeah. We're we're gonna we're gonna try to be hopeful in the end here because this is a solvable problem. Mm. These are mm. you know outside of you know the genus ex, you know genus loss. I don't know what you call the loss of a genus. You know, loss of a species is an extinction. Loss of a genus is an unknown thing, but it's happening. I can show it to you. We just saw the loss of a genus, but anyway, that's a word I haven't. We haven't figured out meta, yet, but we... Meta extinction. You know, there's like mm. xenocide, but again, that's one species. That's like too cool of a word. What do, you, what do you call it when you lose a genus? What's the word? We're doing uh... it. We're killing them. Um, so this is, this is a timber harvest that, you can, that has been done. Again, you can manage, and we have good regeneration in here. We have nice oak regeneration in here. You can manage forests. You can do it. You know... In most forests, it takes work. In some, like this one, it's a beautiful site, and it didn't take a lot of work. But like, 
these are a sol- this is a solvable problem. This is not a disaster where we walk away and be like, well, I guess we just don't fly jets into you know mm. um, rail cars or whatever that was. What was the skyline thing? <laughs> <laughs> I guess yeah, we just don't sure. do that. No, like like th- this is we have only people who are two, trying hard on this. I think there's only been two incidents of a plane flying into a train. <laughs> one in the 30s and one fairly recently, I want to say. Um, <laughs> oh, the trams. It was a tram or it was a sky tram, whatever. The sky right. trolley, whatever. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a tree guy. I, you know, <laughs> I'm going to fall back on this. Mm. So, you know, this is for the most part a solvable problem with invasive species. We know how to manage them. It does cost some money and it also costs not bringing in like that pretty flower you saw on the internet. Like if it's native, if mimosa is native to Africa, it can stay in Africa and be happy there. You have very nice plants where you live. You have very nice dogwoods in the US, in, you know, the UK. I don't know. But yeah, uh, we, I don't know. We got... That's an incredibly managed landscape right there. Yeah. <laughs> Now, I, I have fallen down drunk in a field in Europe, or sorry, in England, and mm-hmm. I don't remember a lot from that, so couldn't tell you what I found on the ground. Oh, boy. Reasonable. Reasonable. We've all been drunk in fields. Yeah. But in my mm-hmm. defense, who starts a wedding at noon and doesn't serve lunch? Oh, no. No thanks. Yeah, that's not my fault. In my experience. The, the, that's the, not the, my fault. The ultimate enemy, the rural bucolic wedding venue. Oh, fuck off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I married in a city. Yeah. Mm. I want to take a rural bus home. stuff is. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So that that's me. You know, this is this is a terrible travesty that is coming at us very slowly. Um, it's a scene in Austin Powers with the where he's driving at the the, yeah. the steamroller at the, the guy. Steamroller at the guy, yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> what was incredibly frustrating recently was I was at a, a conference with some forest landowners and professionals and they were all like, Oh, how do we marketize this? How do we marketize this? It's like, what if we just give you guys money to do good forestry? What if mm. that though? What, what, what an interesting idea. Uh, I can't hear you over the sound of the, you know, uh, cap and trade carbon credits that we're doing. Oh, I'm going to be very honest. I also do that. And that's, it is a, that's a second episode. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you want to do that one, oh god, I would love to at some point. Yeah, uh, actually, actually that sounds like a trash future episode yeah. because that's yeah. that's economy happening. Uh, yes. Well, I'll you guys make it's that's your show. You tell me what you want to do there, but I I do that as well. Mm. Um, you can read my work on that. Else, you know where to, you know how to look me yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Okay. Um, I actually we'll, we'll talk about that later. Um, I don't want to identify myself too much. Okay, so. <laughs> solvable crisis coming up for us we could pay people we actually even have the functions it's called the conservation reserve or preserve program crp it's run through the natural natural resource conservation service the nrcs we just have to turn that fire hose from just farmers onto forest owners it's it's like this is an incredibly solvable problem if we at all think about it president biden please redirect your fire hose yes yes um, Western this- forests are another, like the Western forest fires, another incredibly solvable problem. Hmm. Again, we're just talking money and trees, and but we the problem is, and I'm sorry to keep harping on this, we have expected that forests are a revenue generating thing, and for a while they were, but they're now reaching the point because we have stressed them so much that they are not necessarily that. Sometimes you have to pay for them. And it's okay because they do lots of good things for us. If we're going to take it from a market perspective, it's me like, as a guy who loves trees, it's like we could just—it's fine. It's fine to pay for trees. I love them. Mm-hmm. People love them in general, you know. Yeah. You just is that like in terms of logging, or just like in terms of like letting the forest be what it is? Oh, okay. So this is this is a very easy trap to fall into. Can you go back to our? Um, go back two slides. Okay, so this this is what happens if you don't manage forests. This is the Jesus take the wheel mo- moment. So there's this right. idea out there. It's called proforestation, which is like the nature knows how to handle itself. We have long since passed nature knowing how to handle it. If you know you believe in Mother Nature as a concept, which it's it's just that's a human invention. Um, mm-hmm. You know our native species can't compete. They can't handle these. 
non-native invasive species. They can't handle climate change and they can't handle how we've changed the environment. And we, you know, as humans know how to manage this landscape, we've always managed this landscape. If you take the hand off the wheel, you know, you, you, if you take away management, that's never happened in the history of these forests. That's where we started talking about the native peoples is this forest has always been managed and it always needs to be managed because it's always like, excuse me, that's how the system has evolved. I hate to talk about forests as systems, but, you know, they've always had humans who have always been doing things. So you have to keep doing things. Otherwise, the wheels fall off. So even if it Climate doesn't like Stalin. necessarily pencil out on a balance sheet, it's still, it still, it makes mm -hmm. sense to do this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, once again, how do we value a species? How do you value? I'm, I know Nestle claims to be able to cl value clean water, but yeah. we'll see. You know, uh -huh. How do you value clean water? How do you value seeing wildlife? How do you value the air around you? How do you value not being able to grow anything other than spruce pine fir? <laughs> <laughs> Which you can't grow here in Pennsylvania. It's too hot. This is true. <laughs> you can't do it. You can. They've tried to grow red pine here. It doesn't really work for most of Pennsylvania. Our soil's wrong. Yeah. No. So that's uh, that's the end there. And also, we don't need to like like try to figure this out. Like, we have people whose whole life is managing these these forests to regenerate and grow themselves. Like, that's why I got a job. <laughs> we have books written on this shit. We got books. We got the, the Germans invented forestry as a profession, but people have been doing it in, in you know, the world since there have been people. This is not a new thing. This is an Emily Salvo problem with money. Aha. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And therefore, yeah. climate Stalin. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's me. Well. What did we learn? Thanks so much. Um, yeah. I'm terrified of like five more things. Ryan. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mm. yeah. I'm about to say I'm, I'm scared of several more things than I was. Oh, I'm not scared of shit. I want to hear it out the other baby. Yeah. <laughs> it's a way to be. It's a way to be. It helps you sleep at night. Mm. Yeah. The thing is, I got a nice big glass of bourbon now. Yeah. Well, I <laughs> don't stop using good, you know, American forest products because the second you start using like paper made from like eucalyptus fiber like that's just straight up deforestation oh god all that comes from the tropics like brazil eucalyptus is native to australia you cut down the rainforest to grow it there i thought they put mm. a whole bunch of eucalyptus in california or is that something oh else? yeah no no yeah. they did that and also spain and it causes forest fires out there the fun thing about eucalyptus is it's a fire dependent species it explodes so species, too right well yeah they emit oils that um burn kind of like citrus you know if you like squeeze like an orange rind that light on fire, eucalyptus emits a similar oil because it wants to burn. It yearns for death. It yearns for a really hot death because it's the only thing that can survive that fire. It's a fire-dependent species. It's also a water hog. Hmm. But, yeah, we, but, we haven't even discussed forest <laughs> economics because we don't need to. Trees are funny. Yeah. yeah, we we got we got to get you back on to talk about like forest fires in uh, in California. Uh, oh, that's a solvable problem. Mm. We solved that problem in the forest literature in the eighties. Yeah, move out of California. There you go. Yeah, you don't go to California. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, well, we have a segment on this podcast called Safety Third. Shake hands with danger. Good day. Hello. Oh, to this the is members. already promising. <laughs> Hello to the members of my favorite podcast. Ugh. Dustin the Explainer, Liam the Shouter, yeah. Alice the Best One, and Devin Thank the you. Editor. Go fuck yourself, bud. Nothing Man, for the guest. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I've no, you, you don't you don't get any like yep. heat off of this. I don't know why I'm the best one. I feel like I haven't really been pulling my weight on this one because I've been too terrified. Uh. No, you've been, you've been doing I was, good. I was pretty engrossed in the Thank story, you. honestly. Yes. Yeah. It was really yeah. interesting. This is the problem. Yeah, this is the problem. problem. We get right? guests yeah. who are too we, good. Yeah, We've got to get, like, worse problem. guests. We're Can you be, like, worse guests. at your job? <laughs> or worse at explaining your oh. job? Well, Tell thank us we you. we suck over and over? I don't know. Yeah, do you, do you mind being not as good at your job so that we can, like, so, you know... Get a guest. No, I really... I really love trees. That's the whole thing. Like, I've talked for, like, today, four hours plus on trees. And I could go for another hour and a half. All right, well, I can't, so let's wrap this bitch up. Yeah. <laughs> I want to talk about a, cargo fast. We got to get a, a guest who hates us. We'll get, like, mm. uh, I don't know, uh, fucking Glitter 
Oh, we could get Hayden Clark in. What, we when get, we, we when get we the do the critical the... urbanism guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when we when when we do the the um Monongahela Liberator, that you will get a guest who hates you. Don't worry yeah, about exactly. that. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Well, they yeah. lost. So yeah, I was about to say <laughs> we're gonna be the ghost of 1877. I know we were on the wrong side, but still, they lost. <laughs> yeah, stay on your side. That's what the whole fucking Susquehanna's for, buddy. Yeah. All right, let's do this. Come on. If you're listening to this, you're about to hear a story from the world of motorsport. Yay! Where time is a Three flat circuit circular tables. with history oh. repeating as often as, in this case, the cars race by. In the late 2000s, a European Formula race was red flagged when a recovery vehicle was hit by a race car. In 2014, Jules Bianchi, I'm assuming that's Bianchi, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Died, I almost bought one of their bikes. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, died when he was hit by a recover when he hit a recovery vehicle. In 2023, I witnessed a near miss along these lines. This safe, safety third is brought to you by poor communication and understaffing. Now, motorsport is inherently dangerous, but this so incident. On the ticket. This incident was appalling and nearly catastrophic. It does not say that on the ticket. Yeah. This moment happened at the Phillip Island Classic, a four day historic racing festival. Fun. Um, yeah, I volunteered cool. for all four days and had a headset to help me with my role, which was tuned into the standard race control comms loop. Several comms loops are involved with a race meet, or at least the ones I've been to. Race control handles general communications with race control talking to the scrutineers, noise scrutineers. That's a cool, cool job title. That's a cool job title, yeah. Sector yeah. marshals, boundary riders, and so also on. Also a cool job title. Yeah. Sounds like a Western thing, you know? But not the communicators in charge of the flag points. Having good communications between flag points and race control is vital to safe and efficient operations. So communicators at flag points at Phillips Island have a separate comms loop. Which rather than using wireless headsets, uses hardwired headsets connected through an in-ground network to ensure minimal issues. That's handy. Imagine if you're like a, you you have to wave like a red flag so as a guy doesn't get killed and you just hear the like Bluetooth like low battery. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh fuck. The communicators have the task of quickly updating race control on important stuff like cars passing under red or yellow flags, oil on the track, and crashes and breakdowns, which is, of course, all vital. They must warn race control and other communicators at different flag points of crashed or stricken cars so those flag points can act accordingly and races can be neutralized if necessary. They're also so you don't like run a bunch of cars into the back of someone else. Yes. There are also comms loops for emergency recovery and administrative personnel. But not all volunteers have headsets. At my flag point on the day in question, there's myself, a flag marshal without a headset, a communicator, and a sector marshal overseeing all of us. In other words, we could hear the two most important comms loops and often shared information to keep everyone on the same page. Now, I should give a quick note on flagging in motorsports between sure, two the, flag the points. The right hand pocket is the top, and the left hand pocket is a bottom, and then there's right. a. You know, this green, you know, that's, uh, yeah, so on and so forth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I have a silly question. I've been to like two NASCAR races and been very drunk. Because mm. that's what you do at NASCAR races, but you had to have headphones on even in the stand. So like, they have like ear protection on. It just doesn't mm. connect. Yeah. No, you just have like headphones on or whatever, but like no radio in there. Right. Uh, yeah, it's like three more dollars for. Oh god. And this is uh, <laughs> this is some kind of vintage motorsport thing, which I assume is a little bit more volunteers. Um, janky. Yeah. Janky. Yeah. Janky is the word. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So I, I mean, the, give... se the secret hidden truth of this is that all motorsport is janky as fuck. Oh, Formula yeah. One being a like you know billion dollar business that is oh, yeah. primarily still jank. Well, I figure if you're doing vintage motorsport, um, mm. you know e everyone there is like, okay, this is going to be a little bit janky because we are racing cars from 50 years ago. <laughs> yeah, made out of asbestos. Uh, yes. James Hunt pissed himself in here. Yes, like, uh, <laughs> the, the the racing Sterling suit. Sterling Moss, you son of a bitch! <laughs> <laughs> you get an old enough car, you could say this machine killed fascists. Yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> Why is there an imprint of Nikki Lauda's face in the inside of the windshield? Don't worry about oh, that. God. Shut up. <laughs> Wait, I thought Nikki Nikki Lauda lived though. He did. But like um, he, yeah, uh, yeah, but, he got he got dinged up slightly. Why is there an imprint of Nikki Lauda's helmet in the windshield? Uh, yeah, that's fair. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Shut up and read the goddamn fucking safety card. <laughs> it's so long, too. That's <laughs> <Dance>, monkey. <laughs> it's only a page and a half. That's longer than we say to make them. Let's that's go. A, that's a good point, yeah. I should give uh, so I'm a quick note on flag flagging in motorsports between two I flag flags. flagging in motorsports. For example, <laughs> four and five, any yellow flag incidents are the responsibility of the preceding flag point, which would be the four. Turn five is after the incident and can only wave a green flag to let the competitors know the track is safe after that point. Oh, it's block uh, signaling. Okay. Yes. I should also mention the cars in question, partially because their speed made the situation more dangerous and partially because they're really cool. They belong to the big ticket group for the festival, Group Q&R Racing and F5000, F1, and Invited. I, I, don't, I don't know what that is. I know. The fastest, loudest, and most spectacular group for the event, uh, a Skull Bandit IndyCar. Yes! Yeah. 1985 nice. Ferrari F1 car, check. Ooh. James Hunt's Heskip. Oh, there you go. He did Heskip. piss himself in that. <laughs> <laughs> Along with other incredible machines, including several F5000s, which are, you know, 70s formula muscle. They are the most difficult to drive and not the most reliable, and it was a breakdown which led to our incident. A car pulled off to the driver's right after turn right one, just before flag point 2.1, coming to a stop in the infield. This meant that flag point 1.2 should have put out two yellow flags, especially when a recovery vehicle drove across the infield from flag point 2.2 to tow it away in what's called a hot recovery. However, due to a lack of volunteers, there was no one at 1.2. In this oh, case, no. I barely understand what's going on here. Okay, um, okay. So, so uh, like, uh, <laughs> oh god, right. So we got so one point one is up here. One point two is down here. Yeah, the car, so the the cars coming in from like one point one down to one point two, and then in between one point two and two point one, one of them comes off. Right. Right. Uh, uh, apparently, so, stopping down here. Yeah. This is the um, worst error I've ever made. <laughs> so so your you, your man at 2.1 then has to like signal to 1.2 to put out a caution flag ahead of it because like if you put out a flag at 2.1 it will be too late. Uh it, the it'll have already gone past the thing. It has to go to the um the like flag point before the accident. Okay. Now, due to a lack of volunteers, there was no one at 1.2. Oops. In this case, 1.1 should have warned the drivers of the recovery, but due to the track's geography, they could not see the broken down car or the recovery vehicle. In my position, which is down here, we had a good view of what was unfolding and immediately grasped the danger of the situation, and our communicator informed 1.1 of the recovery and told them to put out the yellow flag. At 1.1, there was a communicator and a flag marshal with a wireless headset tuned into the race control channel, like myself, and the flags did not go out. Oh, no. The recovery vehicle pulled up in front of the broken race car, and two men got out, protected by nothing else but high-vis shirts and gloves. Oh, no. 
that's pretty good protection. That it's pretty good seal. protection, but you're doing like you're doing like line side like train stuff without like any sort of like protective signals or like yeah, you know. It's funny if you're metal detecting like in an urban place. Look, Jeremy hmm. Clarkson told me all I need is high vis and I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, buddy. Yeah. As mentioned previously, they were on a separate comms channel and would not have sta- uh, started that recovery without permission from race control and would have been informed that the race was ongoing and they were going to do a hot recovery. Everyone at my point was worried, but we were following procedures and only our communicator can- could contact 1.1 and tell them about the situation, which she did again, and the flag still did not go out. Without knowing for sure, I believe the communicator at that point wasn't talking to their flag marshal, although I can't fathom why not. They're in sort of like a Regency costume drama situation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then the field appeared, barreling towards turn one in a tight group. Thousands of horsepower and millions of dollars with an apex speed at turn one of about 150 mile an hour. None of them would have expected a recovery happening in the dangerous position because there were no flags. At a full racing speed, the biggest dangers were a car running wide at turn one or a lead car balking at the site of the recovery and being hit by a car behind it, setting off a chain reaction. The cars screamed towards the recovery and passed it by just as quickly without incident. Then 1.1 put out the double yellows, as it should have done much (laughs) earlier. Cool, okay, right after it stops mattering. Everyone at my point took a deep sigh, then complained to each other about how dangerous the moment was as the recovery vehicle towed the stricken car away. I would just like to critique the author for a moment, as my job is to. Um, the cars didn't balk, you know, they're, they're inanimate objects. The yeah, driver has a horse, to balk. Right? The driver yeah. has to yeah. do it, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's actually, and I mean, if it's a horse, it should just be shot. You know, the horse discourse is a whole other thing, <laughs> <Yeah>. but... Oh. <laughs> Kill this... any horse you see, gotcha. Yes, that yes. is here, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, again, we, we didn't get into feral horse discourse. This is not the place for it yet. We, we passed discourse. it, but... Yeah, I, I have lots of thoughts on feral horses. Oh my god. All right. Yeah, we're gonna have to have you back on. What point. animals <laughs> don't you want to kill? I mean, like muskrats are cool, beavers are nice, I'm here for wolverines, <laughs> fishers, uh, most bird species. <laughs> most what, what, birds. Yeah, what about what about like yeah. wolves? Like uh let me let me I don't know. Some... wolves are neat. I have no interest in killing wolves. What about like uh possums? I think possums are good. Oh, no, fine. Good? Yeah, no, I, I only kill things I would eat. I would eat a horse, in case you were wondering. Wow. Okay, yeah. I've eaten a horse. Dumb and mean. Yeah. yeah, that sounds about right. Um, apparently, it was discussed in a debrief among senior officials that night, but it wasn't mentioned in the next day's general briefing. Mm. I was left feeling a bit disgusted, and I realized I could have done more, and I could have and maybe should have hit my radio button and demanded or pleaded with race control to put up flags at 1.1, and I will do so next time. I was genuinely scared that I was going to see a car spear off and kill people. Yeah, you got to go up the up the chain of command for that, I guess. Uh, yeah. Because, man... Like, it, that's why would they just not speak to each other? Like, when it's literally your job, what were they doing in there? Jacking it. Jacking it? You think? Jacking you think that's a jacking it situation? Okay. Oh, well, lack, of, lack of object permanence. I can't see the problem. Mm. Therefore, I am. Cargo vest? Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I was, I was like, uh, you, you know, know I was I'm looking at subway I'm sticking with jacking it. You know what? I'm sticking with jacking it. Uh, we jacking this it. This race boring as hell. <laughs> <laughs> just take my dick out. Uh, <sighs> anyway, stay safe and keep podcasting. It's my favorite podcast. And Thanks, an extra too. bit, if you think this wasn't Australian enough, the Hesketh hit a wallaby in a practice session. <laughs> <laughs> How are we feeling about killing wallabies? <laughs> wallabies, yeah. Um, well, well, so in the US, kill them non native. Uh, in Australia, fine. Yeah. No opinions. <laughs> and by hit, I mean the subsequent cleanup was stopped after the larger parts of the corpse had been removed, and the Hesketh was also a lot more red than it was the lap before. Wait, wallabies aren't big animals, like... 
or about this it. Thing I, I guess they're just sort of like effectively spiritually Australian deer, you know, just <laughs> hurling itself in front of this thing. I'm sure an Australian it. deer is like a kangaroo. It's a kangaroo. Well, yeah, yeah mm. wallabies are marsupials just like kangaroos are. All right, we're just now we're just putting hairs. I, I, I don't know what a wallaby is. Care. How big is a wallaby? wallaby? Yeah, I'm 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 it's like big, I, is it? it's I only know well, it as wallaby, a wallaby, not as an animal. Wallaby. wallaby. It's like 30 pounds. Not the shoes. Three God feet in height, up to twenty-five pounds. It's oh, pretty guy. close. I want to oh, take this away. Cute little motherfucker. Just like yeah. hop right in front of the thing and just get uh -huh. dusted. Uh -huh. <laughs> just, yeah, again, like atomized. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Turned into Chucky Verdera. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Swamp wallaby. Oh, I fucking what a weird <laughs> looking animal. Thing Jimmy Carter almost got killed by. <laughs> what? How? No, that's something different. Oh, mm. that was the that was the Jimmy Carter almost <laughs> swamp rabbit, a giant yeah. swimming rabbit. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we do have swamp rabbits. Um, and I have seen them try to swim across large rivers, and they do it very well. No thanks. Mm. They don't even Perfect. care if you're hunting them with yeah. like beagles. They just jump right in the river and just deuces. Good for that man. Yeah, try and try and kill the president. Yeah. All right. Are we done? Un under under express instructions by Devin to not give them another three hour episode. Yeah, that was safety third. I promise you, like a like an hour and fifteen minutes. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Take the album that one. Shake hands for danger. All right, cool. So our next episode is on Chernobyl. Yeah. Does anyone have any commercials before we go? Yeah, we have a new Ooh. PO box address. We'll update it in the fucking video description. Yes. Send us shit or don't. I don't yeah, care. Yeah, the, the, the PO box. I'm the works one who has now, to check but it's it, a so. new one. It's a new yeah, PO I box. Go, I gotta go to fucking K and A, bro. Oh my so, god! So people, people shouldn't find me, but I do have to do this one thing. There's a little podcast, probably no one has heard of. It's it's this thing called Bunta Vista, yeah. um, mm, and then oh, this the month yeah. of Playpool. I do need to plug the podcast Bunta Vista. Hell uh, yeah! Wonderful podcast, especially if you spend a lot of time thinking about the death of multiple species, and you'll pick me up every now and then. Check it out. Mm. Yeah, I was absolutely. listening and... to the Bunta Vista I'm a Train intro yesterday, and it drove me mad because I was trying to figure out how the DB Class 101 uh, is three phase. Pop, yeah. And I realized that this was um, apparently that's only in the traction motors and it gets single phase from the overhead wires. Anyway, um, <laughs> those are all words. I'm sure they mean something to yes. somebody. I'm just saying, like, if you like sometimes get depressed at work and like occasionally listen to an episode, the same as episode back to back, it's fine. It's a great yes. podcast. Go yes. for it. Ch check out the podcast, Bunta Vista. Mm -hmm. I own a coffee cup from them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> podcast. Kill James Bond, Lions yeah, Led by Donkeys. Uh, I uh, have a commercial. Feature. What, dude? Okay. So I have uh, some colleagues who are attempting to get a petition signed to get put up for a vote additions to the DSA Democratic Socialists of America um ex explicit mention of nationalizing the railroads right okay um and this is something which i think is probably not not so controversial among our viewers if you are a member of the Democratic Socialists of America in good standing you can just sign this uh we'll put a link in the description um yeah and that would be voted on at the next convention. And, you know, they'll figure it out there. Um, so that's my com that's my commercial. <laughs> Beautiful. It's wow. We went two hours, 40 minutes on this. Okay. Um, Apologies to Devin. Sorry, Sorry Devin. Dude. You're the best. 